Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine. Uh, just before we do that, the Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of privilege. Mr. Speaker, earlier today, the Chair of the Law Amendments Committee violated the privilege of the Leader of the Opposition by attempting to silence him and stifle his freedom of speech as a member of this legislature. When Legislative Council advised him, the Chair, of this error, he was not moved. Not only were the Chair's actions a breach of the long-established rules of this House, but they also went against precedence. The member was acting, the member for Picto East was acting within the rules and had his voice silenced. What the Chair did is really an affront to this Legislature. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member for Picto East had asked during the committee, during the meeting, to put off uh, the Financial Measures Act bill until after the bubble legislation because he had an amendment to make to the Financial Measures Act. There was no vote on the motion. The chair agreed. The uh, presenters then proceeded on the bubble legislation. But after only one speaker, the member for Hans East, who was sitting on the committee, made a motion to advance the Financial Measures Act without amendment. The member from Picto East, uh, leader of the official opposition, spoke for 10 minutes or so. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I would like to remind people that people can speak in committee. Uh, there are no limits to a member's speaking in committee. Mr. Speaker, at that point, the member from Hans East wrote, uh, raised a point of order and suggested there should be a vote on the Financial Measures Act. Uh, the chair of the committee agreed with her, ignoring the advice of legislative counsel who was in the room at the time. A vote was conducted. Uh, points of order were then attempted to be made by the member for Picto East and also the member for Kings North. Uh, those points of order were ignored by the chair. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, two points. Uh, the member for Picto East didn't get to speak to his completion, which violated his freedom of speech. And secondly, he also didn't get to make his amendment to the bill. Mr. Speaker, this is very concerning, and this has come up before in the legislature. And I'll quote, Mr. Speaker, when uh, the, the Liberal uh, Party uh, raised this very issue. And Mr. Sampson, in 2001, and if I may quote, stated, they ran roughshod over the rules of this House. Democracy was trampled over completely. Mr. Speaker, uh, at that time, uh, back in 2001, the Law Amendments Committee was considering Bill 68, Health Care, Health Services Continuation. Mr. Speaker, it was a progressive conservative uh, speaker at the time. Uh, speaker Scott found in favor of the Liberals at that time. And if I may quote in his ruling, Mr. Speaker, he's, he, when he had called the House back to order, he said, uh, the Honourable Member for sackville cobequid rose on a point of personal privilege after I've had an opportunity to review the facts, it is my ruling that the matter brought forward by the Honourable Member for sackville cobequid that there's a prima facie case of privilege. I ask for the consent of the House that the matter be referred to the Internal Affairs Com Committee to deal with the matter. Mr. Speaker, uh, ultimately uh, the ruling found uh, that uh, it had to go to the, law, the Internal Affairs Committee, but it, the matter also had to go back to the Law Amendments Committee. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the committee had to meet again to ensure members had their say and to make their amendments, as they have a full right to do here in this legislature. Uh, no witnesses presented at the meeting, but members were permitted to do that. Uh, the matter was also seen serious enough to be warranted to go to the Internal Affairs Committee, according to the Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, there are times when the Speaker uh, cannot rule uh, over business conducted by a committee. However, Mr. Speaker, we have this precedent. We have this precedent uh, where Speaker Scott uh, ruled in favour of the members who raised the point of privilege at that time. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask that this decision made this morning by the Law Amendments Committee, uh, governed by the Chair of that committee, uh, be reconsidered and be overturned. The Honourable, uh, the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, I think everyone that was in the room today, uh, members of the public, members of the opposition, government members, everyone watching at home and, and in their various locations saw this for what it is. This was a filibuster. 
we, we, we'll hear and we'll, we'll get a lecture about this is about democracy and all these different aspects of what happened. This was a direct attempt by the opposition to drag out law amendments until noon so the clock runs out and then we're out of time to debate these bills. Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the opposition didn't speak in what wasn't the first uh, respondent for the PC party for the budget in the FMA. He didn't speak at all about this on opposition days. There's no opposition, opposition bills directed to the budget. We didn't talk about, he didn't talk about the, the budget so far in supply, which is every single day an opportunity to discuss the budget and the associated FMA. There are plenty of opportunities. Mr. Speaker, we have Committee of the Whole House still uh, pending. We have third reading still pending on the budget. That is ample opportunity. The Leader of the Opposition has the floor for question period. We have late debate. There's tremendous opportunities to talk about this particular FMA and the related budget. This was about getting to the clock to 12 noon today so we couldn't continue Law Amendments Committee and then that throws out the schedule for everything else. Mr. Speaker, in every, at every turn, every turn. Order please, the Honourable Government House Leader has the floor. At every turn, that one of the most difficult things for us on this side, and I know some members have felt this in their past uh, and some hope to feel it in the future. When you're on the government side, it's nothing but a question of your integrity and your respect for the public. And yesterday, we took a bit of a, a roughing up, and I was on the, the Law Amendments Committee, about giving the public the time to speak, giving the public the opportunity to come and share their thoughts. This morning, there were 12 people lined up to speak on the abortion bill from the NDP. Twelve people, if the leader of the opposition had a filibuster, which was exactly the plan, we would have went to noon. Twelve people would have went home without presenting to the Law Amendments Committee. One, stu one person in particular said she, let she skipped school to be here to present today on the abortion legislation, Mr. Speaker. This is not about the, the members are going to talk about rights and privileges. I was on Law Amendments yesterday. I was there today. This was the first time that I, I saw the Leader of the Opposition there. This was about coming to waste the time of the government, waste the time of the House, waste the time of the people and not allow this abortion bill to go through today to push it off to another day. This is the, the business of the House. This was the focus of today. And it's been, it, the attempt was to spend the, the clock to get to the point where all the, the schedule for the next rounds for these bills to be thrown off, Mr. Speaker. That's what this is. So what I appreciate uh, would, in your ruling, consider the fact that this is what it is. There's no secret about what the Leader of the Opposition was trying to do here today. This was not about democracy. This was about filibustering our amendments to the, to the legislation and our FMA that's going to move forward. Thank you. Leader of the official opposition. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I wasn't aware that the government gets to dictate when members of the opposition can speak. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, we have a law amendments committee in this province, and it is very unique to this province, and it should be respected. Uh, and when the committee started, I, I asked for and received the permission of the chair to have the uh, presenters present in the order they were scheduled. And I was very clear that my, my intent was to be respectful of the presenters. When I saw the schedule, I knew, saw that the FMA was second, and I said, Mr. Chair, how about we proceed with the schedule, let all of the speakers who have taken their time to come to Province House to speak, and then we revert back to the FMA because we have an amendment to table. The Chair granted that permission because he knew it was a reasonable request. And, and for the government house leader to suggest that it's up to him to determine whether I speak to a bill at second reading, or into supply, or at law amendments, or at committee of the whole house, or at third reading, it is not the position of the government house leader to dictate when a member of the opposition speaks to a bill. We had an amendment to present. We had the agreement of the chair to recall the FMA after the presenters had presented, and it was the chair of that committee, aided by the member for Hans Hees, that reneged on that permission, and it was the chair of that committee who broke with a long-standing precedent, the long-standing precedent that has been here before me, before every member in this House, and will remain after every member in this House, is that when a member of the legislature is speaking at the Law Amendments Committee, it is their privilege to speak until they are finished. And the chair of that committee took it on himself 
against the advice of the Legislative Council to overrule that precedence. Now, this is a government. We know what this government's motives are. We've seen it with public accounts. We've seen what they've done to the public accounts. This is a government that does not want to be held accountable. We have a law amendments committee in this province for a reason. And I take from the government's House Leader's words that he regrets it. I understand that this government does not like to be held accountable for their decisions. I had received a number of comments from members of the public to present at the Law Amendments Committee. Of course we know given the short timeline, it is not, there is not ample opportunity for Nova Scotians to come to Province House to present at Law Amendments Committee. We know that the government uh, has a tool in their toolbox which is to shorten the notice period. But that doesn't mean that Nova Scotians don't have something to say about a piece of legislation. And the legislation in question that we're talking about is the Financial Measures Act. The act that dictates the spending of this province in many respects. 11, 12 billion dollars of spending, of programming. And if that is the act that this government wants to silence the opposition on, silence the voices of Nova Scotian on, I think it is just more evidence that what we in fact have is the least open, the least transparent government in history. But I ask, Mr. Speaker, that you put all of that to the side and you look at the long-standing precedent. You look at um, uh, Speaker, uh, Speaker Scott's ruling and you uphold the traditions of this House, which are that a member of the opposition is entitled to use their voice at the Law Amendments Committee. They are not meant to be dictated whether they use their voice at a time that is convenient to the government. If the government wants to put a motion forward that dictates when certain members can speak about which bills and at which stage, they have the majority government, they can do it. But right now, that is not the case in this province, fortunately. And Mr. Speaker, I ask that you, I ask that you see this for what it is. You see the abuse of my privileges as an abuse of the privileges of every member in this House, because there will come a time when every member in this House wants to speak at law amendments. If we're fortunate enough to be here long enough, there will come a time when every member will want to speak at the Law Amendments Committee. And the precedence that was set this morning by the chair of that committee is such that it is not up to them when they speak, it is up to the government. And Mr. Speaker, that is wrong. I urge you to return that bill to the Law Amendments Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, uh, pardon me, the Honourable Member for King South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. S Speaker, uh, to all members of the Legislature, I was chairing a committee meeting this morning and was faced with a difficult decision, which uh, all speakers and committee chairs face at times at committees with respect to f making the right decision. I had a member of that committee openly declare that he was going to talk for hours. I had citizens sitting in the gallery that had taken time out of their day, time away from school, to present. Law amendments is for the people. It's where the people speak. It is not where we speak. In fact, the day before, I instructed and asked quite firmly to the member of Halifax Atlantic to stop with the three-minute preambles, we're here to hear from the public. The opposition party brought forward an uh, amendment to that table, pre-written, pre-written, drafted with Ledge Council, I believe, and the appropriate place to bring that forward is a Committee of the Whole. There's every opportunity at Committee of the Whole where everyone in this House can debate that with 49 members that sit here today not just 10 members. Nova Scotians and Canadians are asking us as politicians to work together. They're pleading for us to stop this partisan bickering. And in the committee that's dedicated to the public, what did we have? Partisan bickering. So I chose to make a decision to side with the public and respecting the public interests with respect to the Law Amendments Act 
and knowing full well that all the privileges of the members of this House remain here in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I, I've just listened to the, the comments of the member opposite. You know, he, uh, the fact was that the member himself as chair had agreed to let the people speak and then revert back to the Financial Measures Act, which is the legislation my colleague from Pictou East wished to speak on and also make an amendment to. So the chair himself knows that. He agreed with it. He was sitting in the chair when he made the decision. He can't get away from that, Mr. Speaker. He talked about the difficult role of the chair, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would say, Mr. Speaker, if you're a good chair, you follow the rules. Because if you're following the rules, you're taking all of your biases and your judgments and your political leanings out of it. And you're following the rules and you're a good chair. Mr. Speaker, the member has said that he sides with the public. Mr. Speaker, I would ask he and you, I appeal to you as the Speaker of the House, please side with the rules of this House. They're here for a reason. The government can pretty well do whatever it wants on anything, but it should not be able to avoid following the rules. And it should, rules should be followed at a pure respect for what we have here. Because if we can't respect the rules in here any longer, what's the point of us coming here? I'll take this point of privilege under advisement and come back to the House at my earliest possible convenience. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise on a point of order. I'm new to this House, but I'm not new to life. Yesterday, during question period, the Premier lost his composure and implied that the Leader of the Opposition, quote, was not a good human being, and later told the member to, quote, imagine your motive. Mr. Speaker, the statement is simply not true, and the Premier knows, I suspect, that it isn't true. The Leader of the Opposition is a dedicated public service, servant who works tirelessly on behalf of constituents in all Nova Scotians. But beyond that, hurling angry characterizations of this sort across the floor diminishes this place and all who serve in it. During this very short session of the leg legislature, there have been a large number of rulings on, on parliamentary language. Mr. Speaker, at one point, you reminded us in the House that, and I quote, to indicate that another member of this House has questionable integrity is unparliamentary. Given your ruling, I find it strange that a statement that questions the goodness, the very character of a person passed without comment. I note a recent Speaker's ruling in the Canadian Senate about unparliamentary language that I think is instructive in this very situation. <coughs> Speaker Fury ruled, and I quote, to criticize a person's stand on an issue is fine. But to go beyond that and start talking about the motivation or motives of an individual is really not parliamentary and is something that should be avoided. Any discussion on debate is, of course, fine. That's what we do here. This is a debating chamber. But I would ask senators, again quoting, not to go beyond debating the topic or the legislation at hand and to avoid attributing motives for why people take a particular stand. Being new to this chamber, I was appalled yesterday at what I heard. I did not know what to do. This is what I'm doing. With that in mind, Mr. Speaker, I ask that you instruct the Premier to withdraw his ill-advised remarks and make appropriate apologies to this House and the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would encourage you to go to Hansard. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition asked a question yesterday uh, calling into question the uh, integrity of people who aren't in this House and calling into question the motives of a member of this House who's not here today. What I said, Mr. Mr. Speaker, yesterday in the House uh, was directly the very steps that I took 
in dealing with the issue that I remember I had before, and I said that's what good human beings do. It's exactly what I've said, Mr. Speaker. But let me say on behalf of you and the members in this gallery, if anyone was offended by anything I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I apologize to them. But the reality is I know exactly what I said. I said I know what good human beings do, and I laid out the steps of what people do. And we had a member who was in crisis who came before us as, as a caucus. And what we did is we put in place the appropriate steps for them to receive treatment for an addiction. And I said that's what good human beings do. But if in any way, Mr. Speaker, that offends anybody in this House, I want to apologize to them, but I want to reassure all of them. I will continue to tell all Nova Scotians, when they see a citizen of this province who is struggling, who needs support, whatever it happens to be, <coughs> reach out, support them, because, Mr. Speaker, that is what good human beings do. The Honourable Member for sackville cobequid Mr. Speaker, good human beings help each other. There is no question about that. The comments and the back and forth that I witnessed yesterday went a little bit beyond talking about that particular issue. It came to attacking, in my belief, a member, the Leader of the Opposition, by the Premier of Nova Scotia. I urge you not only to read Hansard, but also view the transcript, the video of that exchange. I did, and my remarks stand. Thank you, Mr. I'll take the point of order under advisement. We'll now move on with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a petition here. Uh, the wording is, whereas the government of Nova Scotia announced on December 5, 2019, that they would amend the tobacco access regulations by repealing Clause 8B effective on and after April 1, 2020, whereas this will result in a ban on the sale of flavored e-cigarettes and juices, and whereas this action will result in adult vapors returning to combustible tobacco or purchasing flavored products on the black market. Therefore, the people of Nova Scotia demand the Nova Scotia government and all members of the House of Assembly to amend the ban on flavored e-cigarettes and juices as part of a comprehensive strategy to implement legislative changes to more effectively combat youth vaping. I, I have the signature, 45, approximately 4,500 signatures, and I affix my signatures. Petition is tabled. We'll now move on to oh, the Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I beg leave to table a petition. Uh, it reads um, that the undersigned on behalf of Friends of Halifax Common do hereby petition Premier Stephen McNeil and members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to make public all proposed plans for the entire expansion of the QB2 hospital, both the Halifax Infirmary and Victoria General, including its associated parking power plant and other encroachments, as well as all anticipated costs, and then schedule a series of public consultations for the HRM area where citizen input is respected, recorded and responded to. Keep all components of the QE2 redevelopment to the land assembly currently held by the province to the west side, hospital side of Summer Street that includes the former Queen Elizabeth High School and CBC TV properties. Produce and pass pro legislative protection for the Halifax Common such as is currently given to the Dartmouth Common and in light of the very significant negative economic and environmental effects of demolition and rebuilding, revisit the plan to demolish the Halifax Infirmary's Roby Street parking facility and retain it inst instead. Um, there is one signature on this petition. Uh, electronically, almost 3,000 signatures were collected. I have affixed my own. I'll take the petition under advisement and come back to you after I've had a chance to review it. We'll now move on to presenting reports of committees. The Honourable Chair of the Law Amendments Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is Friday. Let me bring a little bit of energy to the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee on Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 241, an act to amend chapter 66 of the revised statutes 1989, the Change of Name Act, respecting the protection of communities. 
Bill number 242, an act to protect access to reproductive health care. Bill number 243, an act respecting certain financial measures. And bill number 246, an act to recover opioid damages and health care costs. The committee recommends these bills to the favourable consideration of the House without amendments. The, just before we table that report, the Honourable uh, House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, there is a matter before you, a point of privilege before you, that pertains specifically uh, to the Financial Measures Act, Bill Number 243, which is part of the package the Minister has just put forward to be tabled. Uh, so respectfully, Mr. Speaker, we would say that uh, until the point of privilege is ruled upon, that bill should not be reported back to this House. Okay, I've been advised by the clerk that I will be able to accept the uh, report from the Law Amendments Committee under advisement, and when I come back with a ruling on the point of privilege, we can deal with those matters at the same time. We will now move on to tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll try again to inject some positive energy on a Friday afternoon. Mr. Speaker, in my capacity as the Attorney General of Nova Scotia, I hereby beg leave to table amendments to Nova Scotia's civil procedure rules. The report is tabled. We'll now move on to statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Premier on an introduction. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this Sunday is International Women's Day. It's my privilege to recognize in the gallery women who work tirelessly and passionately to prevent gender-based violence in our communities, raise awareness, and support survivors. It's important that we honour them on International Women's Day because of the tremendous work that they do every day to support vulnerable Nova Scotians and to keep women and girls safe. So when I read your name, I'd ask you to stand. Uh, Crystal John, President of the Nova Scotia Association of Black Social Workers. Karen Pictou, Executive Director of the Nova Scotia Native Women's Centre. Karen Bernard, Sexual Violence Prevention Coordinator of the Nova Scotia Native Women's Centre. Ellen Marshall, Public Relations of the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association. Emma Halpern, Executive Director of the Elizabeth Fry Society, Mainland Nova Scotia and members from the YWCA, Sharon Garcia, Ama Asubutan. Good effort, wasn't it? <laughs> Donna Snare, Carrie Johnson, and Krista Maynard. I ask uh, all members of this host uh, to give this extraordinary group of women uh, our thanks and a round of applause. Minister responsible for the status of women. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I do see that one woman um, I, I think was missed, and I would like her to rise and please receive the warm welcome of the House. May I? Two? And Pat. Yeah. I'm going to, yes. Please rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. I hear 
hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas March 8th is International Women's Day, a day to recognize and celebrate women and girls in all our diversity and the difference we make to this world. And whereas advancing gender equality means addressing pressing and complex challenges like gender-based violence, economic insecurity and underrepresentation in leadership. And whereas the theme for International Women's Day 2020, Each for Equal, is a call for each of us to work together to build a world where all women and girls have equal opportunity to thrive. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of this House of Assembly recognize International Women's Day as an opportunity to work together with community, government and public and private institutions and enterprises to advance gender equality for all women and girls in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas AF Terrio and Sun Limited is a boatyard based in Matagan River, Nova Scotia. And where since their inception in 1938, they have built over 900 vessels for a wide range of uses and clients. As one of the largest private boatyards in Atlantic Canada, their modern and well-equipped facility can provide fishing boats, passenger vessels, commercial work boats, fire patrol, and pilot boats, as well as luxury pleasure yachts. Whereas on at at the 2019 Yarmouth and Erie Chamber of Commerce Business Awards, AF Terrio Shipyards won the Large Business of the Year Award. Also, their managing director, Jills Terrio, part of the third generation of Terrios that worked there, was honored, had an honorable mention for the Business Leader of the Year Award. Therefore, it be resolved that AF Terrio Shipyard, along with their managing director, have been recognized as an innovative business and exporter that place a strong emphasis on construction quality and safety of the vessels they build. Mr. Speaker, I'd, uh, I'd ask request for waiver of notice and pass it without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, I would, last, I would ask the staff the one staff member of the Advisory Council on the Status of Women who is with us today because the rest of them are off at a conference, um, a Canadian conference uh, on, on domestic violence, Mr. Speaker, so I would ask Pat to please rise. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas March 8th is International Women's Day, a day to celebrate women's achievements and reduce inequality, and whereas the staff at the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women endeavour on this day and every day to advance the rights of women and gender equality, and whereas the members of the Advisory Council give government advice and wise counsel on issues pertaining to gender equality in order to advance the economic and social condition of women, therefore be it resolved the members of this House of Assembly thank the staff and members of the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the status of women and support them in the important work they do to advance the situation of women in this province. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. It agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I do an introduction before I read my notice of motion? Permission granted. Thank you. In the East Gallery, we have with us today uh, Mr. David Curry, who has uh, recently stepped down as president of the uh, Bird Society here in Nova Scotia. And uh, with him, actually, he has his future son-in-law, Chris Surrett, who is the head of A for Adventure, who do also does tremendous work in conservation and recreation in, the, in our beautiful wilderness areas across the province. I ask them both to rise and, and receive the warm welcome of the house. Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. 
Whereas November 16, 2019, David Curry retired as the president of Nova Scotia Bird Society, and whereas he has personally welcomed almost every new member of the organization, inspired countless people to become involved, and connected many people with the joys of birding and conservation, and whereas through his love of birding, he has helped the organization achieve significant changes, including working to protect nine properties in Nova Scotia. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly congratulate David Curry on 37 years with the Nova Scotia Bird Society and thank him for the significant contribu contributions he has made over the years. Mr. Speaker, I request a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I'd like to direct members' attention to the East Gallery, uh, where we have joining us uh, Cassidy Megan and her mother Angela McCarthy. If you please rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, whereas the, one of the goals of International Women's Day is to recognize achievement and Cassidy Megan began a movement in 2008 to create awareness globally uh, to support epilepsy. And whereas Purple Day has now reached 100 countries, and on March 26th, people will wear purple to raise awareness and help make positive impact for those living with epilepsy, their family, friends, and community. And whereas on March 7th, the annual Purple Day Gala will take place at the Westin with the theme, The Roaring Twenties, Great Gatsby, Old Hollywood, because 100 years after 1920, one in 100 live with epilepsy. Therefore, I encourage all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to congratulate Cassidy Megan, the founder of Purple Day, on realizing her dream as Purple Day has gone around the world to raise awareness and support for those people living with epilepsy. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give no notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the North Bay Fishermen's Cooperative, Anakinish County, has operated in various forms for 84 years. And whereas North Bay Fishermen's Cooperative has had their members voluntarily take the lobster quality and handling training and have initiated vessel quality lobster grading. Whereas the North Bay Fishermen's Cooperative has signed on both the Catch to Plate initiative and the Nova Scotia Live Lobster Quality Certification Program. Therefore, it be resolved that all members of this House thank the North Bay Fishermen's Cooperative for their continued commitment to providing the highest quality seafood products for their clients. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage to the debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> Just before we move on to introduction of bills, I'll bring an in easy ruling on the petition that was tabled earlier uh, by the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham, and we will accept the petition with one signature on it, although I should note the note about the electronic signatures is irrelevant for our purposes here. So we will table that petition. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. I beg leave to introduce a bill, an act to amend Chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Environment Act. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Environment Act. Bill number 250, an act to amend chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act, and chapter 1 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Environment Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill on behalf of my colleague from Dartmouth South. 
uh, entitled An Act Respecting Energy Efficiency. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham, on behalf of the Member for Dartmouth South, begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Energy Efficiency. Bill number 251, an act respecting energy efficiency. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I beg to make an introduction. Uh, I beg Permission to Permission granted. Thank you. In the, uh, in the East Gallery, we have with us two uh, hardworking, intelligent young women who grew up in my riding, and I'm delighted to read this member's statement about their amazing journey that they've just embarked on. But, Mr. Speaker, in honour of International Women's Day, I rise to recognise two young women who grew up in Clayton Park West. Sarah Dobson and Grace Evans are two Dalhousie students who have embarked on an amazing journey together by writing a book that highlights all the women who have served in Nova Scotia legislature. The book is called On Their Shoulders, The Women Who Have Paved the Way in Nova Scotia Politics, and it is expected to be completed by late spring or early summer, I believe. Uh, and it, uh, Proceeds from the book will go towards a new scholarship at Dalhousie University for young women who are entering po uh, political science. In order to accomplish their goal of $20,000 for the scholarship, they have also launched an online fundraising campaign which, which can be found at project.ca backslash women in politics. I encourage all members of this house to donate to this wonderful cause. I am so proud to have been part of this book, which is hopefully, uh, which will hopefully inspire the future generation of elected women. I am so glad to know both Sarah and Grace, and especially Grace, who was my summer student uh, in my constituency office last year. Mr. Speaker, I ask that this House of Assembly join me in applauding Sarah and Grace for all their accomplishments. I know their journey to do many great things in life has just begun. Thank you. To remind everybody, the time allotted for member statements is one minute. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the last 30 years, Bonnie MacGyver of Liverpool has served as a beacon of community spirit in <coughs> Queen's County. This year will mark her 30th and final year working at the Do Re Mi Preschool in Liverpool as she will be retiring. Working with young children has been more than a job for Bonnie. It's a calling. Hundreds of Queen's County children have had their lives forever marked by Bonnie's compassion going beyond just academics and learning about community spirit and the joy of giving back through food bank drive, sending letters to troops at Christmas, working with the Salvation Army and other initiatives. To those around her, she is a wonderful boss, teacher, friend and mentor. Bonnie's legacy will live on through the spirit of giving bestowed upon her students to the enrichment of everyone in Queen's County. Well done, Bonnie. You will be missed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, as we approach International Women's Day, I want to recognize the ongoing effort and accomplishments of the Immigrant Migrant Women's Association of Halifax. This group has been providing support to immigrant and migrant women and girls since 2012. Its objectives are to bring their voice into larger movements aimed at improved well-being and progress of women in the Halifax Regional Municipality, to bring awareness of their concerns and do advocacy work, to research and assess situations affecting immigrant and migrant women and girls, and to showcase their projects, initiatives and contributions to the community. On Sunday, on International Women's Day, the association is hosting an event featuring mothers and daughters reflecting on how their relationships are shaped by the immigrant experience. I ask that all members wish them well on International Women's Day and in their future and ongoing initiatives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. 
Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, with us today in the East Gallery, we're joined by Carrie Copeland, who's the Executive Director of Doctors Nova Scotia Healthy Tomorrow Foundation and Kids Run Club. Uh, and she's served the, the boards of Phoenix Youth Programs and Avalon Sexual Assault Center, and a past winner of the Progress Club of Greater Halifax Women of Excellence Award. Today, Carrie is joined by, uh, by her husband, Graham Packman, who I would ask to also stand, and Leah Jabour, Kids Run Club Coordinator. So please rise and receive the warm welcome of the house. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, in recognition of International Women's Day, I rise today to highlight the work of Armdale's Carrie Copeland. Carrie began her career in social work and has a long-time passion for healthy living and helping children. In 2004, Doctors Nova Scotia hired her to create and launch Kids Run Club, the first school-based, province-wide, free-running program for children and youth in Nova Scotia. The program helps more than 16,000 Nova Scotia kids embrace active health living annually. In 2018, Doctors Nova Scotia created a registered charity known as the DNS Healthy Tomorrow Foundation. Carrie became its first executive director and leads Kids Run Club through that organization. She enjoys her work with volunteer teachers and regional reps and sees every day the difference that fun physical activity makes for school communities. I ask all members to join me in congratulating and thanking Carrie for the difference she makes in the lives of children and their families. And I also at the same time want to acknowledge the work of Dr. Alex Mitchell, who was supposed to be here today. Um, uh, who is the chair of Doctors Nova Scotia Healthy Tomorrow Foundation and the senior medical director of the QE2 Foundation who also works with Carrie. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Speaker, I rise today to uh, recognize a very unique event taking place in my home community this weekend, the 13th annual Quinn and Wild Game Evening and Auction. On uh, March 7th, the, Le Club des Audacieux de Quinnen will host more than 300 people. Over the years, this event's popularity has grown and has welcomed uh, people coming as far away from uh, British Columbia and the United States. The tickets are highly coveted, and if you're lucky enough to get your hands on one, you'll be treated to an array of wild game dishes, including a variety of rapi pies, porcupine, ducks, beans and bear, deer ribs, moose cabbage rolls, rabbit soup, and I could go on. Hosting an event of this size could not happen without the many volunteers, donors, and the support from neighboring communities. I ask all members of the legislature to join me in congratulating the organizers of this event and thank them for their hard work making this event a success year after year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, as the first woman elected as the MLA for Cape Breton, Richmond, I would like to recognize women involved in all levels of politics and leadership roles in public and private enterprise. Women's progress is largely due to the sacrifices of the trailblazers who paved the way for other women throughout the year. Mr. Speaker, there are challenges to being a woman in the male-dominated world of politics, which is why I pay homage to the bold women who have served as members of Richmond County Council. Madeline Lib Gail Johnson, Shirley McNamara, Margot Landry, Audrey Boudreau, Andre Sanson, and Vera Doucette. Mr. Speaker, municipal government has the power to influence positive change and impact the daily lives of the people within the communities that they serve. These trailblazing women inspired others to come forward and serve at one of the most impactful levels of government in our democracy. Mr. Speaker, I wish to recognize and thank these women and all women within my constituency for their public service and recognize the advantages of encouraging diversity and equity at all levels of government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the bravery, courage, clarity, and heart of all those who came today to speak in support of women's access to reproductive health services at law amendments. Rebecca Rose, Gina Grattan, Megan Boudreau, Kev Corbett, Alex Stratford, Rebecca Faria, Kevin Payne, and Dr. Melissa Brooks. Thank you to each of you for taking meaningful action and engaging in the democratic process. We know that there are many barriers to participation in the legislative process, just as there are barriers to access to abortion services. 
On the eve of International Women's Day and every day, our caucus deeply appreciates your support as we work to increase access to social, economic and reproductive justice for all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, permission to make an introduction? Permission granted. Today in our East Gallery, we are joined by with, in, with individuals from Alexander Keese Brewery, and I'd ask them to rise as I uh, say their names. Wade Keller, Matt Miles, Vanish Ramnareen, Derek Bernard, Jim Gallant, Carly Gilbert, Sean Adams, and Spencer McNaughton. And I would ask members to give them the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. De definitely, a po definitely a popular group, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize that 2020 marks the 200-year anniversary since the opening of the iconic Alexander Keith Brewery. In 1920, Mr. Keith, in 1820, Mr. Keith, who had emigrated to Halifax from Scotland, bought his first brewery and named it Alexander Keys. After leaving his Argyle and Water Street locations, he built his new brewery, which is still known today as Keys Brewery Market, which sits within my own riding. In addition to his brewing business, Mr. Keith was elected mayor of Halifax three times, 1843, 1853, and 1854. And he was also appointed to the Legislative Council of Nova Scotia in 1843, where he was president of the council from 1867 until his death in 1873. This year, Alexander Keys Brewery will have a number of the celebrations and events to mark the anniversary. The actual date is July 7th. Please join me in congratulating Alexander Keith's Brewery on their success that the entire city, province, and country can celebrate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to bring recognition to a great group of 12 to 18 year olds, the 24 Royal Canadian Sea Cadet Corps Magnificent Sea Cadets. This fantastic group of youth meet in Shearwater where they learn sailing, leadership skills, and participate in parades, just to name a few of the activities. The group is also offered the opportunity to participate in the marching band, rifle teams, marksmanship, and exchange travel opportunities. This this year, the sea cadets, or sorry, senior cadets will travel to British Columbia to sail the Pacific Grace, a well-known tall ship. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing the 24 RCSCC Magnificent Sea Cadets for their dedication to their own group, the entire group in our community, and for their determination as they approach their 75th anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, as we approach the two-month anniversary of a tragedy that affects countless individuals and families in Halifax, across Canada and in Iran, I wish to take a moment to remember the victims of Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752 that was shot down on the outskirts of Tehran on January 8th. Of the 167 people who lost their lives, more than 130 were en route to Canada. In Halifax, Dalhousie University engineering student Masume Gave and her younger sister Mandia were both on the plane, as were Mariam Malik and Fatima Mahmoudi, who were both in the Master of Financial Management program at St. Mary's University. Dr. Sharia Faghihi, a Halifax dentist and faculty member in the School of Dentistry at Dalhousie, also died in the crash and leaves a large circle of family, friends and faculty members in Halifax. Though the tragedy is no longer on the front pages, I know that for so many the grief is fresh and keenly felt. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for those member statements and we'll just get ready for our question period at 2 p.m. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Department of Health and the Nova Scotia Health Authority here in Halifax released their updated wait times for knee and hip replacements. 
433 day wait for a hip replacement. 601 days for a knee replacement. The national benchmark is 80 days. When you layer in another 154 day wait just to get a consultation, uh, these numbers get even worse, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Premier is based on these numbers, should Nova Scotians have confidence that the health care system is meeting their needs? The Honourable Premier, the Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for bringing this important topic uh, to the floor of the legislature. Uh, in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, endorsed and supported and invested in a proposal that came forward from frontline uh, health care workers to uh, advance a, a model of care uh, as well as an expansion of uh, health care professionals, hire more, so an investment of money, uh, to actually complete more orthopedic surgeries. Uh, that, Mr. Speaker, has resulted in about 700 additional surgeries uh, per year from when we first uh, came into office. So, Mr. Speaker, we continue to uh, invest and support the recommendations come from the front line, and we'll continue to do that to provide the care to Nova Scotians. They need and deserve. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the issue is without benchmarks, there's no accountability. Uh, so that's probably the reason that the government had promised to meet the benchmark uh, by, the, by the start of next month, actually, and they aren't even close, Mr. Speaker. Six months is the benchmark, and we're looking at almost 15 months for hips and 20 months for knees and another five months on top of that uh, for a consult. And to make matters worse, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Nova Scotia Health Authority here in Halifax isn't even willing to offer a timeline to meet the benchmark. So it's like the government's totally backing away from meeting that benchmark that they promised to meet. Uh, I'd like to ask the Premier, uh, will the Premier acknowledge that these types of wait times, these figures, uh, and the completely missed deadline represent a, a, a failure on the part of the government? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member uh, for uh, the question. Uh, I would certainly encourage the member to go back to the announcement. Uh, when we uh, announced this program, this initiative in the fall, uh, I believe, of 2017, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, let the record uh, show that I did not commit to making those benchmarks. What I said was this was a program designed to move us towards uh, the benchmarks, Mr. Speaker. That continues to be the objective and the guideline that we continue to pursue. Uh, what we've seen, though, Mr. Speaker, is that there are multiple variables at play. Certainly the growing demand within the system, uh, the work that we've done to get over 700 additional surgeries uh, completed each year, uh, Mr. Speaker, that's a significant increase in the number of surgeries based upon the recommendation. So clearly it works, but we have more work to do and we're committed to doing that work. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I think it is very clear that there's more work to be done, Mr. Speaker, and that's why this government is now backing away from the commitment to be held to a benchmark. And we can, we can all see why. It's the same reason the Premier didn't want to take responsibility for health care when he was asked that simple question uh, last okay. session. It would be nice if the Premier uh, put the same priority on replacing knees and hips as he puts on replacing hospitals. It's almost like this government still believes that the solution to hallway medicine is better hallways. Mr. Speaker, we know that's not the case. The Premier believes that buildings save lives when everyone else knows that it's actually doctors and nurses and paramedics and other allied healthcare professionals that save lives. The Premier still believes that his healthcare system isn't in crisis. I'd like to ask the Premier uh, if, he, if his gover government couldn't meet this deadline and is now backing away from the benchmarks that they agreed to, why should Nova Scotians have faith that any health care improvements are on the horizon that will actually improve access to health care? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the fact that we be able to get a new contract with Doctors Nova Scotia to continue to make investments not only uh, Mr. Speaker, and the men and women who deliver our services, but unlike the Conservative Party, we also know we need to make investments in infrastructure, quite frankly, and we're hearing from frontline health care workers who are telling us uh, we need to continue to make that investment, and it's, that's, it's the kind of thinking that the leader of the Conservative Party is, is uh, talking about in this House, Mr. Speaker, has led us to this point, where infrastructure is falling down around us, and health care providers say we're not working there. Start improving the health care infrastructure. And, we'll, and you'll be able to attract health care teams across the province, and Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we're doing. When you're in government, Mr. Speaker, you have to do more than one thing, Mr. Speaker, than just complain. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. 
Thank you. My question is for the Premier. The, the former Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act contained a target of 40% of our electricity generated by renewable sources by 2020. But since that legislation was replaced last fall, we've been operating without any target. We in our party have called for a bold, forward-looking target to be put in place, but so far the province is still without one. When will the Premier tell the people of the province what renewable energy targets his government will commit to? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, we continue to lead the country with uh, GHG reduction. Uh, we're currently right now uh, at 30 percent below 2005 levels, where the national government wants us to achieve that by 2030. We're currently there today. By 2030, will it be 50 percent below, uh, Mr. Speaker? We're working towards net zero. Uh, and as the honourable member knows, uh, there is ongoing consultation right now with Nova Scotians when it comes to the renewable energy sector. Uh, and you would also know, as we continue down this road, uh, there's many opportunities, uh, whether it is hydro out of Newfoundland and Labrador, hydro out of Quebec, uh, the potential of our own Bay of Fundy, uh, more wind energy. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, those opportunities will be there. Uh, we're working with our sister province in Atlantic Canada to strengthen the energy transmission system so that we can maximize. Uh, the renewable energy here, not only for ourselves, Mr. Speaker, but the, for excess that we can sell into the marketplace and bring back uh, capital to be spent in our own province. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, we, we also need bold and forward-looking targets for energy efficiency, as well as a strategic plan for putting those targets into place. A comprehensive energy efficiency strategy could create thousands of jobs and at the same time make so many people's homes uh, more affordable and warmer. When will the Premier commit to aggressive energy efficiency targets as part of a comprehensive plan for combating climate change? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question and the dialogue that I had uh, with his colleagues last night. Uh, in that conversation, uh, I had a, a great opportunity to talk about how we've expanded every efficiency program past uh, just electrically heated homes, allowing more Nova Scotians to utilize the programs. We just signed a First in Canada agreement with our Mi'kmaq leaders to retrofit 2,400 homes over the next 10 years. Uh, and, some, and some important statistics that I've already said in regards to our energy efficiency and our green energy. Energyhub.org in 2019 has ranked Nova Scotia number one in Canada in solar. Efficiency Canada has ranked Nova Scotia number one in efficiency programs. And Efficiency Canada has ranked Nova Scotia number one in efficiency workforce. So, so Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in these programs to ensure that as many Nova Scotians as possible can utilize these programs. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the mandated five-year Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act review is now more than three years past due, and we're operating without the goals, without the, the targets, without the teeth that were in that piece of legislation. So when will that review be put before the people of the province, and when can we expect a <coughs> comprehensive set of clear and precise targets for where on these fronts we're heading? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Well, member, bringing up um, what we do uh, feel very proudly as Nova Scotians is one of the most uh, ambitious pieces of legislation in the Sustainable Development Goals Act. In that act, certainly there are foundational things, but we did also commit to going out to Nova Scotians and doing consultation. Also part of that act is, as we mentioned, a uh, report. Uh, in all respect, we did review that report with the round table and that report is ready to be tabled for the House after a final little last look and it will be coming forthwith very soon. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, yesterday morning the CBC revealed that an internal federal document described access to health care for veterans and their families as disjointed and irregular and I'll table that. Family members of veterans are reporting that they are being cut off from care funded by federal government as Veterans Affairs tightened access to mental health programs. Mental health services for families such as therapy were identified as gaps as far back as the summer and fall of 2018 in these federal documents. This is sadly an echo of what we have heard throughout the Lionel Desmond inquiry. And my concern is that health care services and communication between the federal and provincial levels are disjointed and irregular as well. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Health. 
did the Department of Veterans Affairs notify his department that they would be tightening access to their mental health programs? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for raising this uh, important question, uh, both in terms of the uh, health topic as it pertains to mental uh, health and wellness, but also uh, in regards to a very important uh, population of veterans uh, uh, serving uh, and, and living here in the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have a very good relationship uh, with uh, the uh, Department of uh, Veterans Affairs uh, nationally. In fact, I've had uh, several meetings in the past uh, with uh, the ministers uh, in that uh, portfolio over the past uh, almost three years that I've been in this role. We continue to discuss and mental health and, and wellness and other health uh, service options uh, to meet the needs of veterans here in Nova Scotia have always been a topic of conversation with them. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, as federal health care services are denied, Nova Scotia veterans and their families have to rely on our province's overloaded health care system. The CBC article I tabled describes the situation of Veronica Jones from Eastern Passage. Her daughter Ruth's therapy for anxiety and OCD was cut off last September. The Jones family is currently on a wait list and is paying $600 a month out of pocket to continue the care Ruth needs and deserves. My concern is the impact of these cuts to Nova Scotian veterans and their families as well as the ability of the province to accommodate them. What a fate to men and women who selflessly served our country. My question for the Minister, Mr. Speaker, as Veterans Affairs downloads these services on the province, can the Minister of Health say how much the province spends to backstop these services? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member uh, for the question. Uh, in fact, uh, in our, our term in, in office, uh, along with the uh, federal uh, government, uh, there have been uh, expanded uh, services, uh, including uh, the uh, OSI uh, clinic, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, for uh, veterans' uh, access uh, to services. I think that is an example of a, of a great uh, collaborative uh, initiative and, and supports uh, that are uh, delivered here in the province to support uh, health care needs needs of uh, veterans. Uh, as I've also uh, indicated, uh, we continue to have uh, open uh, conversations, dialogue uh, with uh, the Departments of Veterans Affairs on a number of fronts uh, as it relates to providing health services to veterans who happen to be also Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions for the Minister of TIR. Back in September 2018, Mr. Speaker, I invited the Minister to visit with me into the beautiful area of Parisboro. At Parish Brothers and Abateau Bridge, and I'm so happy to hear last night the Minister state and estimates that he's fluent in the language of Abateau. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, this bridge leads to a tourist destination, the Fundy Geological Museum, that sees thousands of visitors each year, the beautiful golf course, but mainly it's a route to many, many residents of the Parisboro area on the Two Islands Road. Since, the, since we heard last evening the Minister is uh, fluent in Abiteau, wondering why? Why did this bridge disappear off the five-year plan? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, yes, we're very familiar with Abattoir in... Uh, <laughs> In, in the department, but not all the uh, uh, the the structures are respond direct responsibility of uh, uh, TIR, and I suspect that probably that's the case in that particular situation. Uh, that uh, we are we are uh, in the process of spending approximately 50 million dollars on overall repair for the abattoirs across the uh, uh, the province, and uh, I'll certainly check to see what the status of that one is. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister's quite right. The Abateau may not fall under his responsibility, but the bridge does. The bridge does. And regularly, Mr. Speaker, the high tides of the Bay of Fundy are covering the road leading to this bridge and off the bridge. Mr. Speaker, the municipal municipality and locals and myself are very pleased to be working on a plan to replace the Abateau at the same time as the bridge replacement. My question for the Minister is, by pushing this project out of the five-year plan, is he just expecting the fundy tides to wash away this bridge? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've said many times in the House, uh, we have uh, 4,200 uh, bridges in the province, and uh, uh, many of them are, are uh, 
uh, more than than 50 years old in uh, uh, and require uh, repair or replacement. And we are uh, constantly monitoring those uh, bridges. Decisions are being made based on the results of the testing that's done annually, and uh, depending on where the priority is for uh, any particular bridge, that determines where the uh, money is going to be spent for bridges. We're in a, at a process in the department of trying to increase the amount of money that we dedicate to bridges, and we're actually uh, uh, taking a, pro a proactive approach in this year to uh, uh, augment the funds that we have for bridge replacement in the province. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Last February, Halifax Police seized 1,900 tablets of an unknown drug after a two-week-long drug trafficking investigation. That drug has since been identified as isotonateazine, a synthetic opioid stronger than fentanyl, and I will table that. This was the Halifax Police's first seizure of that drug. Now it's been found in New Brunswick for the first time. My concern is that it will not be the last time we, last we see of this drug in Atlantic Canada. My question for the Minister of Health, how well equipped is Nova Scotia to deal with the new synthetic drug now coming into our province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for the question, and I'd like to thank uh, all of those uh, law enforcement uh, officials uh, who work uh, to uh, address uh, the uh, illegal um, contraband uh, marketplace uh, to uh, do their part in addressing uh, those challenges, as well as the healthcare professionals who respond to the unfortunate uh, consequences of uh, these uh, products. Uh, of course, uh, this is relatively new, but I'd uh, like to advise the member and all members of the House that our efforts and our investments uh, to help uh, curb uh, the impacts of opioid uh, misuse disorder uh, within the province has been uh, very effective and will continue to do to make those investments and support those health care providers supporting those in need. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, isotona teazine is not only more potent than fentanyl but is also disguised as another drug. The risk of overdose for a disguised drug is more, more potent than fentanyl is obviously higher. In fact, it is said multiple doses of naloxone may be required in order to be effective, and I'll table that. My concern is that the ability of first responders to re respond to this will be a larger uh, with a factor with this new drug. And my question for the minister is, with the recent cut of $7.549 million to ambulance services, how will this affect the uh, ability of first responders to treat cases of overdosing with this new drug? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it will not uh, have any impact. Uh, the uh, budget, as uh, discussed uh, in our 20 hours of discussions about the health care budget, made it uh, very clear that, uh, in fact, uh, the investments to cover the operational uh, costs uh, of our ambulance services uh, remain uh, committed and uh, directed, and that uh, will continue, Mr. Speaker. We also uh, redirected uh, funds to support patient access and flow to help support uh, not just within the ambulance uh, office loading of patients into hospitals, but also uh, patients throughout the hospital, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's uh, where those funds uh, went to, to support not just our ambulance services, and that was an innovative investment uh, fund. Uh, so again, uh, a reallocation is what took place. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to speak to the sad story of 57-year-old Mr. Leonard Boner. He was living in a bachelor apartment which was not at all suitable to his needs. He couldn't walk up steps. He wasn't able to cook because there was no stove. He couldn't shower because there was no shower or tub. There was also no running hot water. In January of 2019, a letter was sent to the, for, to the application supervisor with Island Housing to do a site visit. After a follow-up from my office in August, I was informed that Mr. Boner would be offered the next unit that became available. But that never occurred, as he was continually bumped down the list. Mr. Boner, as a result, could not receive the continuing care prescribed by his doctor, as his accommodations lacked the proper bathroom facilities. 
Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister. What considerations or exceptions are made for individuals like Mr. Boner, which would have enabled him to get the appropriate housing so that he could receive the health services he so desperately needed? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for the question raising the issue. Uh, although I can't speak to uh, any specific individual's cases, I will say that there are a number of programs that we offer out there, and we certainly will prioritize uh, cases that when we're aware that we, we, uh, we do it on a regular basis, we believe that that should be the case. Those that are most vulnerable should be looked after. We believe that wholeheartedly, Mr. Speaker, and if the honourable member wants to see me afterward, and we can talk more about that uh, with regards to that case, there'd be waivers and such that would be signed, but I'd be more than happy to look into that for him. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just to follow up, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Christina Boner, Laird's sister, or brother, sorry, tri sister, tried the best she could to get help for Leonard. Um, on her own, she found empty units that seemed vacant for months, and she had made inquiries about their status. Although there were numerous calls from Christina and my office, there was no movement on Mr. Boner's file. Unfortunately, Mr. Boner passed away this past February of a heart attack and was found by his sister alone in his one-room unit. One wonders if he had gotten the housing that he had been able to receive and continuing care that he needed if he'd still be with us. Mr. Speaker, Leonard's sister is understandably distraught over her brother's untimely death. She wants improvements to the system, but she also wants something good to come from his passing. So I'm glad that the Minister has agreed to sit down and chat with me so that I can update him on this file, because that is what Christina wants. She wants something positive to come out of the sad experience of her family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, for speak Mr. Speaker, and again, I thank the Honourable Member for raising the issue of uh, not being able to speak to that specific file, but I will commit once again uh, uh, in this response that I would be happy to sit down with that member and uh, uh, have a look at uh, what transpired there. And, and we all, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, in this House want to continue. Uh, that's why we invest to continue to see improvements in the system as we go along uh, day after day after day. We're here on behalf of all Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, and the folks working in housing and municipal affairs want to do the very best we can to serve those needs. Thank Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I received communications from frustrated constituents about the 811 Need a Family Doctor system on a regular basis. I'll table this document. Uh, it's an email from a constituent that says, I've called 811 at least five times and have waited over one hour each time, but to no avail. I've tried the website numerous times, and the registration part of the Need a Family Practice does not work now for over two weeks. Sad situation for sure that not only a person cannot get a family doctor, but the registration process does not work either. So my question to the Minister of Health is what measures is he taking now to improve the 811 service for those citizens who need a family doctor and are trying to register? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the member uh, raising uh, this uh, particular uh, issue that her constituent uh, has had. Uh, we'll certainly uh, take a look into that uh, when uh, the House rises uh, to engage uh, staff to uh, take a look and see uh, what uh, may be the uh, contributing. Uh, obviously, I'd assume uh, technological uh, challenges that uh, may have uh, caused the uh, concerns they've had, which uh, in some cases, uh, especially with uh, website uh, technology, Mr. Speaker, sometimes it's on on the system end and sometimes it's on the uh, client's end uh, so it might be something we might have to delve into to get the uh, personal information so we can follow up directly if it may be something on the other side of the, uh, the system. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Another example, Mr. Speaker, a woman who placed her name on the 811 list in 2013 or put it on the list and I'll read her message, part of her message. It's now 2020. I've been living in Amherst now for seven years and still do not have a family doctor. I'm waiting patiently, thinking it must be getting close. But now I hear that former doc patients of Dr. Ferguson's are getting new doctors with before me. I'm frustrated as I'm a 42-year-old woman who has not had a checkup in over seven years. I do not plan on going to the emergency department for routine yearly checkups. I last talked to A11 and they said I'm still on the list so long as they can confirm. Um, they said they've been updating it since 2017. Will I ever get a family doctor? Who knows? And I'll table that document. Mr. Speaker, we know preventative care 
makes a difference in health outcomes and in health equity. So my, my question to the Minister of Health is, uh, will he acknowledge that the lack of primary caregivers in places like Cumberland North are contributing to poor health outcomes? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's uh, great uh, when uh, members of this legislature can come to uh, consensus. Of course, uh, the member can uh, look at uh, our government's uh, platform when we came into government in 2017, very clearly highlighted uh, primary care as a, uh, as a priority and a very important policy position for us to take. That's why uh, we continue to make investments in new programs and training opportunities uh, that, in fact, to address the access to care, we recognize that a significant uh, necessity is in increasing the supply of primary care providers. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we've expanded the uh, residency program, of which 20% are allocated to uh, the uh, Amherst uh, region, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're investing, supporting, uh, and expanding, and we're seeing success, Mr. Speaker. 20% fewer Nova Scotians registered to uh, in need of a primary care provider, Mr. Speaker, since about the last 14 months. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Recently, released documents show that Alton Gas has met numerous times with federal bodies. The discussion appears to have been how to help the company bend federal fisheries regulations to their advantage. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier condone the level of sway that, that this private corporation appears to have over our regulating bodies? Mr. Speaker, the Honourable I, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'm not sure that I uh, understand the question. I don't know what sway uh, this company has over anyone. I want to tell you uh, this, this project has gone through uh, the same environmental assessment, uh, Mr. Speaker. Other projects have gone, and uh, I've said in this house many times, this province has a duty to consult, and we believe we've met that. The Honourable Member for Devon North. Mr. Speaker, the response from the provincial government appears to be that because the company has not dumped any brine into the river yet, there is no cause for concern. But this cannot be the approach of an effective regulator. Mr. Speaker, what is the role that the government has in proactive and forward-looking protection of our environment over reactionary scrambling once the mess has already been made? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I, I, you know, uh, in regards to Alton Gas, let's be clear that Alton Gas went through uh, an environmental assessment and is currently uh, has an industrial approval. Um, they've also expanded uh, that industrial to approval to include uh, uh, communications with uh, the First Nations in that area. There is also a, a judicial review that's going on before that. As far as the federal work goes, um, clearly there are uh, legislations uh, that fall under the federal purview that we have no control over that uh, will affect that project and it's up to the proponent to move through that area. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Of education, I've learned that the Director of the Wicogma Daycare is stepping down in June. That would leave only one level two educator which means the daycare will close due to the ratio. They've been trying to hire for two years with no luck. A closure affects many families. The daycare in Wicogma has been a success story. It opened a few years back and has since expanded. Everyone was happy. Then came the pre-primary program. Wages and benefits went up for anyone who went to work in the pre-primary system, which caused many workers to leave private childcare. Market disruption caused by the good intentions of the government. Pre-primary has been around for years now, Mr. Speaker. Why does the government continue to ignore the risk of lost private child care for the families who depend on it? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we've been working with the regulated child care sector. We've more than doubled uh, government subsidy in the regulated child care sector. That sector has grown at the same time as pre-primary by approximately 2,200 spaces across this province, Mr. Speaker, in areas where child care did not exist before. Uh, we realize when you create 630 new jobs with good wages, with good pensions and good benefits, that that creates labor pressure. Uh, we're responding by training more um, early childhood educators. We're recruiting more. We have an immigration stream to also diversify that workforce. We have bursaries for African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq uh, learners who want to pursue that degree, Mr. Speaker. And for the first time ever, we actually have a wait list of people trying to get into an early childhood uh, learning program. These are positive benefits to the people of this province. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, despite all those measures, they've been trying for two years. They're not able to get anybody. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and this was not a problem before. 
uh, Mr. Speaker. These private centres, uh, I, I think what's happened, Mr. Speaker, the government has essentially increased the cost of childcare with the introduction of pre-primary. These private centres could increase the fees the parents are paying to pe provide the higher wages needed to attract people, or the minister could further increase the operating subsidies he's referred to, to do the same. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, does the minister's actions suggest that this government believes private centres, like the one in Waikagma, should raise their fees for parents? who need childcare for children that are not old enough to go to pre-primary. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the members should be aware that private centres are not allowed to raise their fees. Um, we invest in subsidizing affordable child care for people in this province. We know that it is needed for families and, and kids uh, from one end of this province to the other. We have a vested interest in the success of the regulated child care sector, Mr. Speaker. We invest $80 million a year. That's $30 million more than we invest in our own pre-primary program. Where we help every single center who is having a recruitment issue do our best to help, help fill positions. We have a working group right now I met with this week who said how happy they were with the support they're getting from, from the government. And these are, this, is, this working group is made up of VCEs and businesses, business owners, from one end of this province to the other. Mr. Speaker, we are on the verge of transforming early childhood education in this province, going from a situation where only one in four families could access this to one where every single family will have access to high quality child care and early learning. And I wish this party would get on board. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nursing homes are an important option for people who have difficulty performing everyday tasks such as dressing, bathing and toileting. It is shameful that the McNeil government has essentially Order, cut funding. I remind the honourable member not to refer to the government by the proper name of the premier. The honourable member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for clarifying that. It's uh, sometimes difficult to know what to say. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is shameful that this government has essentially cut funding for long-term care facilities every year for the past five years. This has led to a staffing and infrastructure crisis and a lack of beds due to it being leap year. I've learned that the Treasury Board is shortchanging these long-term care facilities once again by refusing to pay the long-term care facility for February 29th. My question is simple. Would the Minister of Health and Wellness inform this House why the Nova Scotia Treasury Board is reaching into the pockets of seniors and taking out $110 from 7,800 residents like to remind in the Honourable Member, the phrase reaching into the pockets is an unparliamentary term, well documented in this House. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister of Health tell me why the Treasury Board is collecting $110 using whatever means at their disposal from 7,800 residents in long-term care for February 29th, 2020, but not forwarding that money on to the long-term care facilities who are trying their best to look after these seniors. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to respond to a question which I responded uh, to. I think it might have even been raised by the exact same member uh, just a few days ago uh, within our 20 hours of debate. I guess uh, it can be uh, excused uh, for if they don't uh, remember everything I said at that time. But Mr. Speaker, I made it very clear that in fact uh, it had been communicated to uh, long-term care providers that in fact uh, that leap year day was being covered uh, as it uh, would be expected to be. So again, I believe this is the third time this question has come up. Uh, once to myself on estimates, once to the Minister of Community Culture and uh, our Minister of Seniors, uh, and again here today. Uh, I don't know how many times we have to answer the same question on the floor of, of the legislature or committees, but Mr. Speaker, let me be abundantly clear. That funding is being provided as previously communicated to the member. The Honourable Member for Paul Harbour Eastern Passage. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is probably the first time in my sessions in the legislature that something I've asked got an actual answer that actually resulted in the right thing being done. So, Mr. Speaker, I would like to know now, because I did raise this during estimates with the Minister of Seniors, and I can't exactly recall the exact words that he said, but he said, yes, I heard you mention this before, so the heat or the volume of something has been turned up. So can I ask the Minister of Health why it took me raising this in the legislature? Really? 
When did you pay this? So, Mr. Speaker, let me address Order, my questions please. through the speaker. Like the Remind the Honourable Member to address your questions through the Chair. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I always appreciate you clarifying how I behave in the House. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister exactly when that approximate $858,000 that was uh, collected from seniors is going to be returned to the nursing home? So, can I Honourable ask when the Member cheque's going to be written? Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, happy to clarify, as I did during estimates, when I believe it was that member who uh, raised this question. Uh, in fact, uh, this information was communicated uh, to uh, the industry uh, in, I believe, sometime in early or mid-February. Uh, so uh, long before, Mr. Speaker, we took uh, our seats here uh, this session sitting uh, to, uh, to, to advance a question. So uh, again, uh, I appreciate the member's interest and support of government's decisions but uh, our decisions, when they're the right decisions, Mr. Speaker, are not necessarily informed by the position that the member takes. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Well, Mr. Speaker, it must be Friday afternoon. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, Cape Breton Regional Library Services have evolved over the years by providing access to technology and supporting digital literacy. They preserve and promote culture, creativity, as well as safe physical spaces that encourage community involvement. Libraries need to have a strategic plan to address funding challenges like rural population decline, rising operation costs, and changing roles of libraries and communities. So my question for the minister, does he agree that the current funding model is not meeting the requirements and evolving needs of Nova Scotia's libraries and users. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, uh, pleased to stand on my place today and say that we have responded uh, to uh, librarians, uh, to the two boards uh, that administer the library system across the province, and we've come up with a formula that uh, both includes population as well as the needs of certain areas because the per capita funding was not working. The new system, in fact, is designed by librarians across Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, libraries across the province are places where we can meet real people face to face and hold books in their hands. Library programs such as story time, books, book clubs, classes and more foster real friendships between people and bring the community together. The current model for funding libraries is not meeting the requirements and evolving needs of the Cape Breton Regional Library and users in my constituency. So my question to the Minister is, since the Cape Breton Regional Library System is the second largest library system in the province, will he commit to more equitable funding for that particular system? The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the member opposite is exactly right. Uh, our libraries, uh, our libraries across the province, our libraries across the province have become hubs, welcoming centres, truly uh, the community centre uh, for many of our small communities in, in particular. And what I'm pleased to tell the House and all Nova Scotians uh, that the new formula uh, does, in fact, is weighted to support uh, Cape Breton that had a major loss. Uh, uh, and decline in population until recent years, until recent years. But the, the monies in the budget this year, a uh, little over $2 million plus a half a million dollars for innovative projects, in fact, will give Cape Breton an opportunity for additional money. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of TIR. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister knows, winter driving can be treacherous in Nova Scotia and having winter tires on your car does give better traction. I believe it's safer to have winter tires, but we don't know exactly how much it helps because we don't collect data on tire type and condition in accident data, and DTIR is responsible for that data. My question, Mr. Speaker, for the Minister is, will the Minister commit to changing the accident data reforms forms to collect tire data in accidents? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite uh, for the very uh, relevant question. Uh, in, uh, though we don't actually formally uh, collect that information, it is noted on the reports that are submitted uh, by the, uh, by the uh, relevant police authority that's involved at the, uh, uh, at, at the event, at the accident, and uh, the condition of the, uh, the tires on the vehicle are, is rec recorded at that, uh, in that report that we get. The Honourable Member for Col uh, Kings North. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the Minister said yes and no in that answer, actually. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I'm not clear, but I, I hope we are collecting the uh, data, and I hope that it is good data that we can use to formulate decisions maybe sometime in the future. Mr. Speaker, last year the traffic si we had passed the Traffic Safety Act, but now we are waiting for the regulations. It does seem like a long wait. And it would be worth waiting if there was better accident reporting forms in that. So my question is to the Minister, when will we see the Traffic Safety Act regulations and will there be the opportunity to have public consultations on the regulations? Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question, and great to uh, uh, see him recognize the value of the uh, uh, change in legislation when we abandoned the uh, uh, old Motor Vehicle Act, which <clears throat> was dating from the 1920s, and come up with the uh, Traffic Safety Act. As I'm sure the House can appreciate, that's a significant change that was made. The Act is very comprehensive, and we have a team of people who have been working steadily on the regulations, and it's, it's our our target that we will have those regulations available for uh, enactment in the fall of this particular upcoming current year. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is for the Minister of Health. With her encouragement and consent, Cynthia Cochran Smith is a 49 year old resident of Sackville Cobequid. She has acute asthma, exasperated by respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, and has been unable to work since February 2019. She traveled to Hamilton twice to receive specialized MRIs and was told in a letter that I will table that she would be reimbursed for her travel expenses. As you can imagine, the financial hardship of these trips would be difficult without the assistance of MSI. With costs totaling nearing $4,000, to date she has only received $1,200 toward reimbursement. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister is, will the Minister tell me when Ms. Cochran Smith will receive the full amount of her travel costs, including hotel and transit, from Toronto to Hamilton, as she was promised by MSI? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the member uh, bringing the question to the floor of the legislature. Uh, as, as the member would know, uh, I, I'm not in a position to speak uh, directly. Uh, the member may have a waiver, but I, I do not, uh, Mr. Speaker, so I'm, I'm not able to disclose uh, additional information. I, I hope he can respect that. But in a broad sense, Mr. Speaker, I want uh, members to know that uh, MSI does have a uh, very clear uh, process. We do uh, provide out-of-province travel for medically necessary uh, treatments uh, that are not available with Within the province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, under a year ago, we expanded our travel program here in Nova Scotia to make it uh, one of the uh, best out of province travel uh, programs because we uh, listen to uh, feedback. Uh, we continue uh, when people have uh, input uh, on these uh, initiatives uh, to take them under advisement and, and review to uh, make uh, appropriate uh, decisions. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response. I'm sure Ms. Cochran Smith would be pleased to get a letter of consent for you to talk about that here. Canada has a great system of reciprocal billing between provinces for health care. It is an important piece of our health care system that citizens are guaranteed access to the best treatment options available in this country. What is clear, however, is that when travel to another province is necessary, it is because our health care system cannot provide the necessary treatments here at home. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister tell me how much money is budgeted for Nova Scotians this year to travel to obtain treatments that are not available in this province? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the mem member for uh, the question. Uh, I don't have my uh, budget uh, document here in front of me, so I don't uh, have the, the number offline uh, or on, on the table. Uh, unfortunately, in the 20 hours uh, we did discuss the health care budget, uh, this is not a question uh, that uh, came uh, from members opposite, uh, but certainly if the member's interested, I'll, I'll look it up and, uh, and, and track that down for him. But, it, uh, but uh, that said, Mr. Speaker, as I've mentioned, we've extended uh, the program last year, uh, which means uh, further investment, and in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, uh, when we provide uh, care, uh, whether it's in province or outside of province, I want members to know that these are clinical decisions, not political decisions, that are being made to ensure that Nova Scotians get the care that they need. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in a recent news story, a well-respected general surgeon, Dr. Phil Smith, spoke out on his reason for leaving the Cape Breton Regional Hospital in Sydney. Dr. Smith was recovering from two orthopedic surgeries and requested a modest leave of four weeks, but was denied. Now he practices elsewhere. He spoke out because the Cape Breton Medical Association is demanding that this province's health authority change the leadership at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. The association says the leadership direct direction is directly affecting the delivery of patient care. As an MLA for the area, I know all too well that we are suffering from a doctor shortage crisis. This is only made much worse by incompetent leadership. My question for the Minister, why did it take a doctor leaving to get the NSHA's attention and leadership in Cape Breton? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, indeed, I think uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, has, uh, through uh, leadership of our volunteers that sit on the board of directors, uh, many volunteers, uh, including physicians, retired physicians, retired nurses that uh, sit on that board, uh, who provide directions and, and, and advice to the uh, executive uh, leadership team uh, to uh, set the, the direction and the uh, operational uh, work of the health authority. Uh, I think uh, the member would know, uh, being in the community, that in fact uh, there are a number of uh, executive changes throughout that organization, including Cape Breton, and I don't believe that uh, the two are uh, necessarily directly connected. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Mr. Speaker, this government has let Cape Bretoners down, and we have seen the results of their inaction with the emergency room closures and lack of family physicians. The Eastern Zone Vice President position has been vacant for some time, and no local doctors are even willing to apply. Dr. Smith's story is not an isolated incident. I've heard from many local doctors who say they have let little faith in the current bureaucracy and its strategic or policy direction. Mr. Speaker, you can have the most state-of-the-art medical facilities, but if you have no doctors and no nurses, that's not going to help my constituents. My question for the Minister. How does he propose to restore confidence and faith among healthcare professionals in Cape Breton? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not just uh, within Cape Breton, but indeed uh, across this uh, province. I believe the, the actions and the directions taken by this government and our partners at the Health Authority uh, illustrate uh, how uh, we listen to the front lines, adjust uh, and evolve as an organization. Uh, that, Mr. Speaker, uh, can be seen uh, at the uh, top levels, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, we hear uh, in particular from uh, people in Cape Breton, in the front lines and in the community that we need more local voices, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's exactly what's happening within the Health Authority from an announcement that was made uh, back in the fall to get uh, more opportunity out in the communities. Uh, in fact, Cape Breton says we need more voice. Well, Mr. Speaker, the dep new dep deputy minister that will be starting in April uh, for the Department of Health and Wellness is a physician from Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker. The new CEO of the Nova Scotia Health Authority is a physician, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are listening to frontline health care workers and bringing them into the senior leadership roles to help make those decisions. I hope that helps build the confidence confidence for those members. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Several groups, both publicly and privately funded, offer support and training to women who are interested in entering male-dominated fields and industries. And I myself, Mr. Speaker, am a graduate of the, uh, of the Nova Scotia Campaign School for Women in 2009. I'm a big believer in these uh, programs. We have seen growth in the number of women seeking and obtaining leadership roles. However, women continue to be underrepresented in political and professional positions, even though women make up over half of the Canadian population. So I have to ask myself, Ms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, why are there not more women sitting in this house? So I would like to ask the minister if she is, in, yeah, she's here, um, why she believes 
uh, that we're not yielding better results given the amount of funding that we're investing in these frontline programs. The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. I, I, I would actually say that I reject the premise of her question. I think that we have seen tremendous growth in the number of women in recent elections. <laughs> In fact, Mr. Speaker, in the last provincial election, uh, 17 of 51 members in this House were elect who were elected were, uh, were in fact women. We've had some uh, resignations since that time, but, but what I would like to say is that put us up over the all-important 30% mark, Mr. Speaker. And at 30% in organizations, when you see a population uh, that has been up underrepresented before, Mr. Speaker, when you see women getting over that 30% mark, you start to see change. And I would say that the debate that we had in this House this past week is absolute proof of that. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We will now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I, may, may I make an introduction? Permission granted. Uh, I draw the members' attention to the East Gallery, where we have a, a friend and a great Nova Scotia uh, leader uh, in terms of economic development and innovation. Mr. Jeff McKinnon is a VP of, VP of Operations and CFO with True Leaf Sustainable Foods. Uh, if you don't know uh, anything about True Leaf and Jeff, uh, uh, take a go quick Google search. It's a pretty remarkable story. Uh, really a, a continental leader in terms of leafy greens, organic development, uh, great grow up that's happening in Churro at Perennia Park. Uh, so all the, the international grocers, grocers are flocking to uh, Jeff's operations and uh, finding ways in which uh, True Leaf can, can be part of the, the uh, complement. So uh, great company in True Leaf, Nova Scotia uh, built. And uh, we, uh, with the indulgence of the house, let's wel welcome Jeff here. Great Nova Scotia. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on supply. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to stand and share a few words uh, from the voice of Cumberland South on, on the uh, presented budget. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the title of the budget, Better Together. There's some good points and some good line items in this budget, but as I've heard throughout the estimates, and more importantly in public opinion over the last few weeks, where has this budget been for the last five or six years? Where has this budget been when opposition's been the voice of Nova Scotians looking for issues like, like things that are covered in this, uh, this budget? Better together. Mr. Speaker, I would agree if this were, in fact, true of this government's whole reign over this province. Order, please. Just like to remind everybody, the Honourable Member for Cumberland South has the floor. If we could uh, make our best effort to keep the chatter to a very low whisper, that would be much appreciated. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, but for far too long, promises were made and people have been forgotten. I want to speak more locally for Cumberland South on some issues within this budget. Health care. We still continuously on a daily basis have our ERs closed. We still have one of the highest rates without family doctors. The unacceptable wait times for mental health services. We see cuts to the line of EHS. And Mr. Speaker, even more importantly for a remote area in my constituency, advocate. We see services of people retiring and those positions not being filled. Or something that's different in my constituency, we have empty long-term care beds that we can be utilizing to offset some of those beds that are being utilized in hospitals. Mr. Speaker, roads and bridges. I'm not sure if I'm the only MLA that had a bridge actually disappear off the whole long-term plan, five-year plan. Two other areas in my constituencies have, have, have bridges out for nearly two years. And I'm not talking about the rainbow bridge with the pot of gold at the end of it, that finally, after two years, I do give credit where credit is due, it is finally replaced. But Mr. Speaker, the effects of having that bridge out have taken their toll on the Napan Road. We're not just local traffic, all traffic had to pass over. Mr. Speaker, I have questioned locally, and I'm making it official here on the floor of the legislature, this road needs repaired ASAP. 
For that matter, Mr. Speaker, there are many roads in my constituency along with others. And I'd like to take this opportunity just to name a few, but not all of them, obviously. Wyndham Hill, Apple River, Westbrook, Southbrook, Greenville, Ripley Loop, Roslyn, and I could go on and on for, for a list, Mr. Speaker. Wentworth Collingwood Road. Mr. Speaker, schools. I'd like to recognize the fact that a school in Spring Hill has been promised three times over 10 years, taken away twice. Now, credit where credit is due, Mr. Speaker. There is an open dialogue between myself and the minister, and the minister is vocally and locally committed to the date of 2021. I can speak that I have, I can speak that I have, have been informed by TIR that there is a lot of land that's in the Spring Hill area that is going to see geo, geotechnical testing as early as next week. But Mr. Speaker, we look at the business plan for the Department of Education, or the capital plan, where it states 23-24 for this school, 23-24. And although the minister and myself have been verbally committed in local media and to residents of 2021, we've had that open dialogue. All the people of Spring Hill want to see is the shovel in the ground, the date 2021 to come, where the kids can go and deserve a safe and enjoyable education. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is the government that promised a doctor for every Nova Scotian. That box is still unchecked. Mr. Speaker, they also promised to break the Nova Scotia power monopoly. Another box, arguably still unchecked. A film tax credit to exist for five years, just taken away. But Mr. Speaker, there are some boxes that are checked off. The extinction of local school boards, tick. Dismissal of local health authority, tick. Depletion of the rural population in my area, tick. All these things taking away the local voice of rural Nova Scotia, taking away the voice of Cumberland South, and centralizing it in a decision-making place somewhere in the world of HRM. Mr. Speaker, we can travel the rural roads of Nova Scotia, and it takes hours. For me to drive one end of my constituency to the other, I can be in HRM quicker. There's a big world out there, and we've taken away the local decision-making from rural Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, it's our job as opposition to be the voice of Nova Scotians that feel unheard, that feel unheard or missed. I hold that job very near and dear to my heart. I'm very proud to be standing here, Mr. Speaker. It's our job to hold government to account on decisions. It's our job to hold government to account on their budget and question. And Mr. Speaker, as we've heard even here during question period, it's not government's decision when we as opposition ask questions. There's question periods, there's law amendments, there's estimates. We as opposition have a right through our, our legislative process to ask questions, to hold this government to account, and by golly, that's what we'll do in opposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we'll speak. And we've, we've been accused of holding the middle class as a target for this budget. Well, Mr. Speaker, we'll speak for everybody, the ones in need, seniors, youth, middle class, whatever it needs be, we will be the voice for them because that's our job as opposition. Mr. Speaker, many of these issues in this budget, any government would do. Roads, health care, any government would work onto these processes. Mr. Speaker, a responsible government would undertake and understand that this budget is being made possible because of federal transfer payments, not because of what we're hearing the Premier say that the economy is doing so good here in Nova Scotia. Federal transfer payments. There are some good things in this, in this budget, Mr. Speaker. I can't deny that. I can't deny that. But Mr. Speaker, there are also some bad things in that, that budget. Mr. Speaker, I go right back to an issue of a bridge missing for Parsborough that's been promised year after year. A school that's been promised and now we see from 21 to go to 23-24. And we don't have a choice as opposition 
to decide which line items in that budget that we speak on or vote on or, and, and approve or disapprove. We have to pass or disapprove of a budget, vote for or vote against the whole thing or nothing at all. And Mr. Speaker, these are issues why I can't support this budget for Cumberland South. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the job that I've been elected to do. It's very near and dear to my heart. I'm very proud to be the voice for Cumberland South. It's a very rewarding job, very rewarding job. But Mr. Speaker, as I spoke to business owners and some residents on the weekend sitting in a local Tim Hortons, the question did come up of this government's budget, better together. And Mr. Speaker, the question that budget, that, that those business people were asking, is it truly better together? Is it truly better together? Or are we just hearing a better together theme on the eve of this government looking for something from voters? Mr. Speaker, better together should have a subtitle. Better together after years of separation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion carried. So the House will now recess while the uh, committee sets up.
Order. The Committee of Ho the Whole House on Supply will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, will you please call the estimates for the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal Resolutions 37, 44, and 47. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the NDP caucus is yielding our time for the next 15 minutes to the member for Cape Breton-Richmond. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton-Richmond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my colleague from the NDP caucus. Um, and uh, thank you, Minister, for being here. I have an opportunity to ask you a few questions. I only have 15 minutes of time here, so I'm going to try and be as, as efficient as possible. I uh, just want to state on the record how tremendously uh, proud I am to have like such great uh, working relationship with all of the uh, members of the Department of Transportation locally at home. It's extraordinary. Uh, we meet four times a year. Uh, uh, it's, I think they always feel like there's going to be a two-hour meeting and I keep them there for five. Uh, <laughs> and they're very gracious about it. Uh, and also the relationship that uh, I have uh, built um, uh, with certain members uh, at a higher level within the Department of Transportation, of course, with the minister. So, uh, and I thank the minister very much as well for, um, you know, there was a lot of advocacy work that went into uh, getting some major infrastructure repaired uh, since I've been elected. One of them, of course, was the Lennox Passage Bridge. I think about five, it was $5.6 million at the end of the day. It's massive, massive uh, investment uh, going on to Isle Madame and uh, very much uh, needed and appreciated. So it's a lot of work by community, a lot of work by myself, a lot of work by the staff. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, the decision comes down from the department. So thank you very much uh, to everyone that was involved in doing that. This year, moving forward, um, I've spoken uh, again to uh, the members locally. Uh, we've had a, a meeting just before coming in here, and I, I know that we have a, a pretty good-looking budget uh, going into this year for uh, my area in Cape Breton, Richmond. Uh, there's always, a, there's obviously never enough money to get everything done. Uh, there's a lot of repair work that's going to go you know, not done this year, obviously, and it's going to have to be uh, uh, projected into uh, into the capital plan moving forward. Uh, but it's not, it's a pretty healthy budget this year, so I thank the minister for that as well. Now, my question is, um, there's kind of a, a few things that are, are, are lingering uh, in my mind that I'm, I'm never really quite sure who to ask, uh, and that's really about uh, coastal rehabilitation. So one of the projects that um, I've, I had brought forward, and I'm glad to see that it's uh, in the capital plan, uh, was the rehabilitation for the slope erosion that was going on, going to uh, uh, the overall hill in Jamron's Island. So that's just one example, and it's gonna be a very costly project. Uh, it's only one example of some of the erosion problems that we're seeing all across the province, but especially in Cape Breton, Richmond, because we're surrounded by water. I mean, our whole coastline is water. Um, Isle Madame in particular obviously has certain challenges. Uh, that, that is an island, certainly surrounded. There's some places where there's roadways right on the coast. Uh, not sure what's going to happen to those, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, there's, there's damage that occurs and I guess, uh, you know, when, when is the decision made? not to repair a road any longer and try to bypass or reroute. So I would ask the minister, with all of the climate change and all of the erosion issues and the, the extreme weather patterns that we're having, what is the department doing uh, to look at each of the different uh, regions, uh, mine in particular? Uh, what is the department doing to try and help putting a plan forward to mitigate uh, coastal erosion uh, in Nova Scotia?
I recognize the Honourable Minister for Transportation, Infrastructure and Renewal. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member opposite for the question. And I want to start by thanking uh, her for her kind remarks uh, uh, around our staff and around the relationship that uh, uh, exists and uh, would compliment her on <clears throat> the uh, wisdom of uh, understanding that communication uh, 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 thoughtful communication is the key to uh, uh, to getting things done. And I can tell you that, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, both as minister and in other areas, uh, people respond, especially in the department, uh, when they are treated uh, with professionalism and respect, and uh, uh, you're more likely to uh, get uh, things accomplished. <clears throat> and the question about... Uh, Essentially, climate change and coastal erosion is also a very good one, and one that we are involved with uh, in the department, uh, where we have been uh, developing a strategy uh, over the last number of years, uh, because this is an ongoing theme. As I mentioned yesterday in uh, uh, response to a question from the member from Dartmouth North, uh, the, uh, the uh, issue of uh, of uh, climate change, coastal erosion, relates to the fact that many of our roads in Nova Scotia were built right along the coast because years and years ago uh, that was the area where you'd get a, a, level, uh, a level road, you didn't have to deal with a lot of mountains and hills for the most part. Uh, at that time they didn't have much equipment to be able to, to uh, apprehend a, a place like Cape Smoky as an example. So <clears throat> we find ourselves now uh, in this era of China, uh, of climate change, with vulnerability on these uh, roads that are uh, that are that are close uh, uh, to the ocean, and and we're seeing we're seeing coastal erosion, and I think the Janfrance Island one is a good example of one that we're doing this year, that has that uh, restoration component associated uh, with it. <clears throat> so there are two. Uh, partnerships that we have uh, with the federal government that we're uh, re looking to rely on to help us with these processes. One is the Disaster Mitigation Fund, which is, uh, helpful, has been helpful to us in some applications, and the other one is the Climate Change uh, uh, Fund. So within the department, we have asked all our bases <clears throat> to start accumulating data on uh, uh, coastal uh, erosion and identify the vulnerable uh, roads and road sections uh, that we uh, that they know about and uh, the folks that are in those bases are the ones who know best working with the community where those exist and uh, then uh, using that information to uh, inform our strategy as to how we're going to uh, deal with uh, the process in the meantime we're not waiting until we get that uh, uh, full study report done, we're, we're moving ahead with, again, uh, with areas like Jamrins Island uh, to uh, effect those repairs uh, uh, and uh, protect the integrity of the, uh, of the road system in these uh, communities. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Um, it's good to know that uh, there's an inventory being done, obviously, in the different regions across Nova Scotia. I, I can only imagine, uh, I, I see, obviously, the, the challenges that are, are coming our way within just my constituency, and when you expand that, obviously, uh, to include the entire province, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's enormous, uh, but it is something that we need. In fact, I wish that we would have started much earlier in uh, trying to mitigate uh, what literally is, is, is coming our way. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask the Minister, as part of the, uh, of the coastal erosion uh, strategy and inventory that, that staff are doing, uh, there's many areas in my community that uh, obviously have wharves, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, fishermen in uh, Cape Breton, Richmond, uh, have a very active fishing industry. 
And uh, the wharves and the breakwaters specifically are a huge concern. And now I know that the Department of Transportation is not responsible as the federal government that's responsible for breakwaters. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if you go down to uh, Tidzans, uh, as we say in, in, uh, on Almadam, uh, Little Ants, there is a section of road right at the end that basically is at sea level. You have, um, you have a wall that has been put in by the Department for, of Transportation, as I understand, that's, uh, that's not in the greatest of shape. I know that there's been money put towards it, but it, it needs, some, uh, it needs some, uh, some upgrades. And then beyond that, where you know, the mouth of, of the harbor basically coming in, uh, there is a breakwater that is, uh, it's, well, the breakwater is breaking down is basically what's happening. And so what's, what's occurring is that you're having a lot more extreme wave action coming in and, uh, and, and causing problems, obviously, on the roadway. Sometimes we see that roadway completely flooded. Uh, there's all manner of seaweed and, and, uh, uh, and, and debris on the road sometimes. And there's also another area, uh, well, many areas in the community like that. There's another one um, uh, in Petit de Gras uh, where you've got a breakwater that, again, uh, is part of what would have been uh, uh, a wharf, and that too is so difficult. The difficulty is that nobody seems to want to take responsibility for it. Like the Department of Transportation doesn't want to take responsibility and put money towards it. The federal government has divested themselves uh, of most of the wharves in these smaller communities. And so it's really putting, um, I, I foresee that it's putting actually a lot of Department of Transportation infrastructure at risk. Not only homes, not only private properties, but a lot of our provincial infrastructure uh, is at risk because you have roadways that are going to be washed out or extremely damaged uh, one of these days when there's an extreme storm because you have nothing to, uh, to basically cut down on the extreme wave action that's coming towards them. So could the minister please advise me, um, and this is an important one because I have several of these issues in my community, could you please advise me uh, um, if there's any kind of a partnership uh, program that uh, is currently available or that will be made available uh, in the future, especially after this you know, inventory uh, is completed, it would be great if it was available now, to, be, to, to look at a federal and provincial um, uh, you know, partnership in making certain that our coastal communities are completely protected and that also provincial infrastructure is, uh, is properly protected uh, due to the fact that you know, these, these pieces of infrastructure that nobody wants to have anything to do with, uh, you know, they're falling apart.
Minister. Uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Member, for the question. This is a uh, is a is a bit of a naughty uh, uh, sort of thing because the <clears throat> the various infrastructures you describe in various parts of the province are owned by different entities. In the the instance of Little Ants, the first thing to do would be determine whether or not there is a small craft harbors uh, organization that exists there. If there is a small craft harbors do have funding to replace uh, wharves and uh, breakwaters. And I have to say that I've been very pleased uh, in my own writing with the uh, work that has been done around uh, the uh, small craft harbors. There's a massive rebuild uh, of a breakwater being done now in uh, Half Island Cove, which is a uh, small craft harbors funded, federal, federally funded, totally federally funded uh, program. Directly, our department uh, generally does not have responsibility when it comes to breakwaters. However, if our uh, infrastructure is threatened, then obviously we have to take a look at the situation, and we're always open to partnerships. If the local community, if there's a small craft harbors group um, that is, uh, has access to funding, uh, we, can, we can assist, and, and, uh, because obviously that's to our advantage. In the uh, instance of, uh, of Little Ants, uh, we will take a look at that particular situation and see, uh, do an analysis to see what our responsibilities would be there. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, if the folks in that harbor happen to have, uh, it, it happens to be designated as a small craft harbor facility, then there is definitely access, which they would have to apply for and, uh, and convince the federal government that they should spend there, but that monies are available and they have uh, over the last three years, and unleashed a significant rebuild of the small craft harbors uh, around Nova Scotia. And in my particular riding, uh, not unlike yours, there's a lot of coastline and a lot of, of dependency on the fishery. And it just makes good sense uh, for all the people concerned to have this infrastructure rebuilt. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister. I look forward to continuing the discussions around around these issues. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to now yield the rest of the time back to uh, the NDP caucus and to the member from Dartmouth North. Thank you so much. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, um, I'm going to sort of pick up where I left off last night, but uh, the member from uh, Cape Breton Richmond also was asking some similar questions that I was going to ask, so I apologize if they're kind of similar, but they will be a little bit different. But before we get to that, I um, wanted to talk about um, British Columbia for a minute. British Columbia recently adjusted their, its building code to allow 12-story wooden frame buildings. Uh, it's a move that will create more green jobs in BC through the forest industry while reducing the carbon footprint of the construction industry because wood offers the benefit of being, uh, being made of, carb of captured carbon and of reducing the need for concrete, which the International en Energy Agency estimates is responsible for 7% of a global greenhouse gas emissions. So my question is, I'm wondering if the minister would consider such an amendment here in Nova Scotia to bolster our own forestry industry and reduce our carbon footprint.
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the uh, question. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, we studied, uh, when I was uh, with the Department of Natural Resources, the, uh, the issue of uh, using wood as a framing material for multi-story uh, buildings. <clears throat> and uh, I, you're correct that it uh, emanated from, from BC, because as you know, they've got a lot of big wood out there, yeah. It's amazing if you've ever had a chance to look at it, being one of their mills. Uh, so yes, that uh, is part of the National Building Code, and, and, and whatever applies in BC applies in Nova Scotia for the National Building Code. So theoretically, we could build those same buildings here. So what we are, what we are doing uh, <clears throat> uh, more specifically is uh, there's been uh, a committee struck to look at uh, the uh, local economic benefits of having um, uh, an expanded um, ability to use wood in, in construction in particular, uh, and also uh, uh, to uh, push the other attributes in terms of, uh, you know, my, minority or underrepresented groups in the, in the uh, local economy, such as uh, women, as an example, uh, African Nova Scotians, Indigenous. Uh, that is, uh, is currently uh, in place and is working away and will eventually, I think, lead to uh, the uh, builder, which up, it's really up, up to them, uh, to uh, reach a, a conclusion that they can use uh, wood as a, as a suitable building uh, a structure, which would again be great use for our timber that we have. We produce lots of fabulous lumber in Nova Scotia, and uh, the obvious benefits of using locally sourced material uh, to feed our own job creation uh, is self-evident, really, in terms of what uh, uh, is happening. But in terms of the code question, we are as able to apply those uh, those standards here in Nova Scotia now uh, as they would be anywhere else in the country through the National Building Code. Recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, in July 2019, an expert panel convened by the Council of Canadian uh, Academies, this report, which I'm about to table for you, uh, identify, uh, released a report identifying the top, thank you, impacts uh, Canada can expect from the climate crisis. And the cover of the report is actually a picture of a flooded bridge. The report charted the key areas that are vulnerable to the climate crisis, the two that were by far the most likely and had the most catastrophic impacts, and that's the words they use. Um, <clears throat> the most likely catastrophic impacts will be on coastal communities, like most of Nova Scotia, and on physical infrastructure, including bridges. So we know that your department has estimated it needs $2.1 billion over the next 10 years to get on top of bridge repairs, but does that consider the additional impacts of climate change and the climate crisis?
Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. <coughs> Uh, the answer is yes in the uh, number, whatever it may be. Uh, I think that that was a universal number, the $2.1 uh, that would contemplate replacing everything at sort of one time, which is not the reality that will happen. As an example, this year we have $118 million in the budget for bridge uh, rehab, but the plans and the design that we do uh, for these bridges includes climate change proofing. Uh, for these facilities that are being built. So contemplating the impact of climate change and the abutments, uh, on the design, the width, the span, and all those uh, things that would affect that. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you for that answer. It's good to hear. Um, do you have an estimate of the investments necessary to make the criti all critical infrastructure your department is responsible for ready for the increasing impacts of climate crisis? <laughs> so basically, I'm expanding the question to include all critical infrastructure, not just bridges. <clears throat> Excuse me. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in, in the, uh, we don't have a, a number for the overall one-time fix, as it were, for, uh, uh, for the process. But what we are doing is in all the work that we do currently in our capital plan, uh, in our maintenance uh, budget too, uh, for uh, erosion control, is uh, have a, uh, a uh, set aside for uh, climate change uh, to address that particular situation in terms of any kind of strengthening that might be required, uh, redoing culvert si sizing uh, to accommodate larger flows uh, due to uh, uh, more rainfall from climate change. So within the operating process that we employ in the department, we have insinuated that cost into the, uh, uh, the, the overall picture. It's not uh, uh, separate directly as a line item, though we are setting some funds aside on a maintenance uh, and our maintenance budget for erosion control, but it exists within that, uh, uh, in that financial plan that we have for those uh, roads. The member for Dartmouth North. Okay, thank you. Um, a recent federal report on climate change project projected that as the coast continues to sub uh, subside and oceans warm, Atlantic Canadian coast will see up a, or could see up to a meter of sea level rise over the next century. What level of sea rise are you projecting and preparing for? And can you give examples of the types of coastal urban areas and infrastructure that could be flooded at that level of sea rise? For example, you know, <clears throat> what could happen on the Halifax waterfront or in Truro or Sydney? And yeah, so.
Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, we don't have a direct uh, involvement in that uh, uh, process per se, uh, <clears throat> though we do <clears throat> participate and partner, as an example, with the province of New Brunswick on the Chignecto uh, Isthmus project, which was, is uh, uh, where Order. We were. Time has lapsed for the NDP caucus. We'll move over to the PC caucus for one hour. I recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Minister knows I could probably stand up here and ask questions for the whole two hours this afternoon, but I'm not going to do that because there's a number of uh, caucus members that have questions as well. First of all, I want to echo the uh, remarks of the member from Cape Breton Richmond. I, too, have a great working relationship with the uh, with the crews in, in, that serve my constituency, starting right at the top with Jamie Chisholm and with the two area managers, Steve McDonald and Cody Rowland. But I guess the people I deal most closely with are the OSs like Sheldon Fyander, Joey Parker, Nelson Dixon and Mark Green, and, and they've been fantastic in doing their work. I also want to recognize Mr. Hackett's, uh, you know, every year we, in the fall of the year, we get together with him and we discuss our priorities. And uh, above that, if there's ever a question and a person wants to meet with him, Mr. Hackett's always available. And it's much appreciated. So having said all that, uh, my first question, I guess, is uh, we know that over the last few years, and it's on the uh, multi-year plan, the Seal Island Bridge has been inspected and tests being done. Some work has already taken place. So I guess very briefly, I wonder if the minister could tell me what's taking place on Seal Island Bridge for this year. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair. <clears throat> Thank the member for the question. Uh, and I was just uh, thinking here uh, uh, in response to your uh, question is that uh, I sort of almost am a little afraid to admit this, but I uh, can remember when we used to take Ross's Ferry to get across there uh, and give you an idea of the, how quickly the time passes. And uh, uh, the Seal Island Bridge was always regarded as a new piece of uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> but 
time marches on and it, uh, it's not new anymore. Uh, the uh, uh, analysis of uh, the condition of that particular structure has been uh, underway for two years, conducted by Harborside. Uh, the, the, uh, our staff is working with them now uh, in terms of uh, moving the report forward from the pre-draft uh, side to the draft uh, status and then to the final report, which we uh, are hoping to have, you know, by later on in uh, late spring, early summer. And <clears throat> we're expecting that that bridge uh, review will inform us as to what we need to do there to uh, try and, and uh, 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 increase the longevity of the bridge. Could be new bearings, could be uh, strengthening with new, uh, new struts, it could be painting, uh, as an example, at the final end, resurfacing, that, uh, that sort of thing. We've learned a lot with that bridge uh, since it's been in there, uh, and I think actually one of the, the learnings was that there's more wind load there than what was anticipated in the original design. So uh, at this point, uh, short of a replacement, which would be a, uh, is an eventuality, but an expensive undertaking, uh, we are looking at ways of trying to extend the life of the existing facility uh, with a, a safety as our, our biggest uh, consideration. Uh, and we'll know where we're at with that, whether that's a feasible possibility or how long we could get uh, if uh, or when we get the report from uh, Harborside Engineering. The member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the Minister for that. Actually, Sea Lila Bridge is 59 years old this year. It was opened in 1961. And over that time, I know there's a long history to it. The, the, there was a local bridge crew that looked after the maintenance on the bridge, and uh, that crew was no longer responsible for Sea Lila Bridge, but <coughs> the rest of the bridges throughout the Cape Breton area and, and even along the mainland. Uh, there was also, a few years ago, about $14 million spent on the bridge, I believe. But one of, one of the biggest questions that's always asked or the concerns that's out there because of rumors that start within the community and in the whole Cape Breton area is the condition of the piers on which the bridge sits. I don't know. I believe they might have been inspected uh, during this whole process as well, and I don't know if any reports are available on that or not. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, the uh, uh, reason that the review by Harborside has taken two years is that's exactly where it started. It started with the abutments, with the piers, and worked its way through the entire uh, uh, system. And uh, we'd be more than happy once we get that uh, uh, formally received to share that uh, with the member so that uh, people can have confidence in what we've uh, discovered and what our remediation plan is. There's money in the budget going forward uh, for the next several years uh, for, uh, for remediation and for repair on that uh, facility. So as soon as we get it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get it to you. The member for Victoria the Lakes. You, Madam Chair, and th again, thank you the, to the minister for that. I'm going to move on and uh, talk about the condition of some of the roads within my constituency and indeed any constituency in the province, probably. We all continue to get calls, but I guess my question is going to go on the, the RIM program because I, I get calls about the paved shoulders or lack thereof on some of the roads that it's just eaten away and uh, even the gravel shoulders, guardrails and everything. One, one particular area is the Dingwall area and I, I think that's something that has been on a priority list to get resurfaced. But there's a lot of people travel the road, but there's also a lot of people walk the road, and, and even the walking has become dangerous for those people down there. So I guess my question would be, has the RIM budget increased uh, greatly for the two area managers that, that serve my area?
Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, the overall RIM program in the province is $17 million. In the eastern region, uh, the, in this current year, it has increased uh, by approximately $140,000, $150,000. Uh, I, I can't see exactly how much of that would have gone uh, into the members' uh, uh, area, but uh, we can undertake to uh, dig that uh, number out. The member for Victoria, the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess the reason I ask that is because just for the Victoria County area alone, and of course, uh, under Steve McDonald as area manager, Inverness North also comes into that equation as well. So there are five OSs out there that are looking for some funding to do roads in their specific area, and it's becoming it's becoming a real challenge for them. And the disappointing part is that those are the people that are on the front line that are receiving all the complaints. We, we do get them, but the minute they make an appearance, it's almost like they get the blame for things not being done. And uh, that's a challenge that I know they handle very well, but shouldn't have to be in a lot of cases. So my, my last question, before I turn it over to my colleague from Cumberland North, uh, this winter, and every winter I guess, but this winter in particular, my office has received a lot of calls about the condition of the, the gravel roads, the plowing of the gravel roads in my constituency. Uh, the policy is that the one operator plows to the pavement, but don't go on to the, to the gravel portion of the roads. One particular road, as an example, is Black Rock Road in my area that, that's half pavement and half gravel. So the, the paved portion is done on a regular basis, but it could be sometimes up to 48 hours before the gravel portion is done. So because there is one grader at the, the base in, in Bulletry that serves a, a lot of gravel roads and even down the Tarbot Way and everywhere else, and that, that is certainly a challenge when you only have one grader. Uh, and depending on the list, I think Black Rock Road is probably the last one being done. And that, that might be just a scheduling problem that, that the area manager could look at. But I guess my, my question is, I mentioned earlier about the policy of the, the one operator plows not being allowed on gravel roads. So for clarification and for those that might be listening, can the minister explain why that policy is in place and why those plows cannot continue on their route and they stop salting and just plow those uh, roads as they continue?
Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank the member for the question. And, uh, you know, this is one of these <clears throat> issues that, you know, on, on the surface uh, looks uh, easily uh, uh, apprehended, but when you start looking a little deeper, it becomes a little bit more murky. And the murkiness here is this member uh, would, uh, I'm sure, know that <clears throat> the minute you get salt on a gravel road, uh, you're going to lose that road. You can't put salt on them, they turn to mud and mush. And so, though we could make every best effort to stop the, uh, the uh, uh, salt process at the end of the pavement, there's always the risk of getting salt in the, in the, the, the gravel road. The other factor is, is because of the nature of, of gravel versus paved, uh, they ice up differently. And the, uh, the plow uh, is not as effective at uh, getting through that ice as uh, the greater uh, unit uh, uh, is. Now, this year we have uh, uh, augmented our greater fleet across the province by five new units. Uh, I don't, can't say what the dispersal of them is. Uh, and, of course, we're continuing the gravel road program, which will provide uh, uh, improvement in these gravel roads, rebuilding them uh, again to the tune of uh, uh, $20 million. Uh, but in, uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, tell the member that we can take a specific look at the roads that he's talking about and see if there's a way of, uh, of com coming up with a local solution to uh, help that situation out. The message is that the, the nature of the beast is is quite different in between the gravel and the uh, and the paved. The member for Victoria, the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll turn my the rest of my time over to the member from Cumberland North. I recognize the honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm pleased to be here today to to ask some questions to the Minister of Transportation on behalf of the residents of Cumberland North and. Like my colleague, I will say I have uh, excellent area managers who I'm able to discuss um, the day-to-day -day operations and concerns of local citizens, and they're very responsive. And so the questions that I'll bring to the minister today are, are more uh, higher level um, topics that I know the area managers would probably appreciate me bringing uh, to the floor of the legislature. The biggest... Uh, issue, I would say, pressing the people of our area uh, is the Chignecto Isthmus. And I did have a, a good meeting uh, last month with the project manager from New Brunswick that's leading the study. Uh, as you know, the Chignecto Isthmus has had dikes in place since 1671. In, this, in the area that we're studying, about 35 kilometers of dike, dikes protect these areas and now can contain critical transportation and, and utility infrastructure, including 20 kilometers of the Trans-Canada Highway, 20 kilometers of CN, uh, CN Railway mainline, uh, also used by passenger trains operated by Via Rail, approximately 35 kilometers of electrical transmission lines owned by both NB Power and Nova Scotia Power, and communication and other utilities um, that involve interprovincial trade. So the strategic importance of this infrastructure to all Atlantic Canada and indeed to the nation as a whole cannot be overstated. And I will table this document because it does come from the uh, request for proposal for the feasibility study. But I'm wondering, um, first of all, in Nova Scotia, I know that this is a federal New Brunswick-Nova Scotia partnership, uh, this project, this study. Um, who is responsible within the, uh, for our province through the Department of TIR and if there's any update to provide to the citizens?
Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're pretty happy with the uh, partnership that we forged there, uh, mainly because we got quite a chunk of money from the feds, which is good. Uh, and and uh, New Brunswick is the lead uh, of the two provinces on the uh, project, as you probably know. So internally in the department, <clears throat> it's our internal design group. Uh, it's a lady named Bonnie Miles Dunn, who is actually the uh, uh, heading to Sackville, I think, next week to uh, uh, have another meeting. The anticipated uh, time period for the receipt of the study is 18 months. Uh, we're about six months in now, so it's a little bit early days, and uh, we're uh, uh, keeping a close eye on it because we know that, A, this is of extreme importance to, to both provinces, and B, it's going to be an expensive fix when it does get uh, done. So we're watching very closely and uh, assign some of our best people to it. The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Minister. Certainly it's an important, uh, as I mentioned, important uh, issue to take seriously, and I appreciate all the work that the Department's doing, and anything that can be done to keep the area's citizens updated with accurate information is always appreciated. The second thing I'd like to bring to the floor, and, and this is a topic that the Minister and I have discussed at length, but in fairness to the people of Cumberland North, I want to bring it up at estimates as well, and that is to do with Cobbwood Pass. So we all know the fine, I know that's a big shock, Shock. Uh, we all know the financials with the Western Alignment Corporation uh, show very clearly that there's ample surplus funds there to pay off the debt, to have enough money to do maintain that highway until uh, the 30-year term is up with still ample millions of dollars left over in surplus. And I know one of the reasons the minister has given for not removing the tolls is because he would like to build satellite maintenance areas. So I would like to know what is the cost of those satellite maintenance areas. And I also would like to, to know, is the minister planning on removing the tolls off the Cobble Creek Pass? Thank you.
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the member for the question and appreciate her uh, uh, continued interest in the uh, in the pass uh, as it relates, particularly to her her uh, uh, riding. <clears throat> the I want to talk for a minute about uh, the reserves uh, and, in particular, the capital reserve, which is what we can use to uh, retire uh, the uh, the bond balance which is only part of the cost associated with retiring the, uh, the bonds. The other portion is a what's called a make-whole uh, payment, which is the same as you uh, run into when you prepay your, uh, your mortgage. If you were won the lottery and you're paying your mortgage off, uh, there's a, p a premium to do that early, which is written into the original agreement, and that exists in this uh, uh, process also. And then, of course, uh, there would be the, <clears throat> excuse me, the ongoing maintenance. So in the current reserves, there's a maintenance reserve, and uh, there's another, yeah. what's the other? There's a debt service reserve. Oh, yeah, the debt, debt uh, service uh, reserve also that uh, is there. So in terms of what we're looking at doing there and, and, and the safety enhancement associated with the rest stops, which is a national... Uh, trend uh, we're, we're seeing across the country to enhance the safety for long haul truckers. Uh, we're looking at five to six million per unit, and there'd be two of them. Uh, so that has to be paid. Uh, there's technology enhancements that we're looking at, which we haven't actually priced out yet, uh, but they're not going to be cheap because uh, our commitment was to remove the tolls for Nova Scotia drivers. But that not everybody uses the pass. I is a Nova Scotia, and we haven't decided to vote uh, the commercial trucks uh, uh, as of yet. So, if we maintain a form of tolling there, then it will require a it will require a uh, uh, a, a um, technology upgrade to install readers that will pick up the uh, license plate <coughs> uh, information uh, from the uh, folks who. Uh, who use the uh, use the pass? So, if you tally all those things up, uh, we're a little concerned about the money that we actually have in reserve and its ability to retire uh, all those uh, all those obligations. You know, there's nothing we can do about the balance of the bonds, obviously, and uh, there's nothing we can do about to make whole payment uh, by. Repaying. If we paid it this year, we're paying it, I think, six years early, and uh, that would cost us millions of dollars in, uh, in the make-whole uh, make payment or, or early payment premium uh, that uh, is uh, there. Uh, so that's kind of what we're, why we put the brakes on a little bit to see if we can, if we can make those improvements so that when they're done, uh, they, they, they don't fall to the general revenues of the <clears throat> province, that we can use the reserves that we have, and if there's a residual tolling revenue there, uh, use that to support uh, the considerable maintenance that's associated with, uh, uh, with that particular stretch of, uh, of highway, which is 45 kilometers of, uh, of bypass that's in place there. Thank you. The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So you've, the, I've heard the minister say that part of the financial uh, cost that they're looking at is, is technology to install, um, to be able to detect Nova Scotia residents when they're going through. So I just I want to hear the minister say if I heard that right. So that would mean the plan is to keep the tolls on.
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, for purposes of clarity, the intent of the government at this point is to remove the toll for Nova Scotia passenger vehicles. A uh, decision has not been taken fully on non-Nova Scotia vehicles or uh, commercial uh, uh, traffic. Uh, and uh, to be clear, the uh, technology that we're looking at would involve a, uh, a sticker for the license plate that would be available for Nova Scotia drivers that would exempt them from the toll as they went through the gates, uh, not identifying them for, for a toll. So that's the technology that uh, would be uh, ability, that, that would be installed uh, there, and uh, I, you know one of the things we're looking at uh, is we we do have a, a lot of uh, uh, toll highways in the province. Uh, uh, we obviously have the two uh, very busy bridges here in Halifax, and we have nine uh, local ferries that are, are charged tolls across the province, but we would be looking at uh, the similar technology and maybe a partnership with the Halifax Dartmouth Bridge Commission to operate the, uh, the tolling system there and to get a little better, uh, uh, more efficient productivity and save some money on the technology that uh, we would be uh, using. So it would identify Nova Scotia drivers and exempt them from tolling. The member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for clarifying that. And I'm um, glad to, to actually have an answer to, to understand what direction the department is going. And um, I will say, just on behalf of the residents of Cumberland North, um, they're not happy that they have to pay. And I think to compare that stretch, that 45 kilometer stretch of highway of 104 with bridges and ferries is not fair and for the tolls to be kept on to pay for satellite maintenance areas that the rest of the province are getting with their tax-paying dollars, why the residents of Cumberland North have to continue to pay both tolls and taxes is unfair to the residents north of the Cobequid Pass. So I'm just making sure that that has been stated. And also, I was contacted just two nights ago by another trucker, a businessman who lives in my uh, constituency, and he's sending me his visa statements of the thousands of dollars that he has to spend in tolls every month that a similar trucker in other parts of the province do not have to pay. So I certainly, uh, I hear loud and clear, and I hope the residents of Cumberland North and all those residents living north of the pass have heard the minister today clearly state he's planning on keeping the tolls on. And uh, I, I certainly hope that the minister will consider the business men and women that are exporting goods from our area that have to pay excess in tolls that other business people throughout the province do not have to pay and consider the unfairness of that and hope that the minister will consider also removing the tolls for commercial trucks and traffic from Cumberland North and, and anyone, any businesses that live north of the Cobbacook Pass. And uh, I will table the financials from the Western Alignment Act, which, which uh, governed the Cabo Pass, which show that there is an excess of $72 million in, in revenues uh, sitting there, more than ample money to pay off the $28 million that's left being paid, uh, that's left owed in the bonds. And I will say also, the people that uh, live in the Pugwash, Wallace, Malagash area have asked numerous times for the speed limit that was artificially reduced in the Wentworth Valley. They want that increased. And that was artificially reduced to encourage people to use the Cobbacud Pass. And they're tired of that, Madam Speaker. They would, Madam Chair, they would like, uh, and I'm asking the Minister today to, to look at that. I know when we've asked that in the past, uh, we've been told that that speed limit is not allowed to be put back to what the normal speed limit should be for that area until the, the tolls have been paid and that uh, Cobblecoot Pass is, is uh, removed. Well, if he's making that commitment today that he's keeping the tolls on, then at least 
uh, listen to the people that live in the Wentworth, Wallace, Malagash area. Listen to those people that have been asking for the last 24 years for that artificially lowered speed limit to be put back up uh, to the speed limit that it should be based on that um, type of road. In, all, in other areas of the province, that type of road would have a higher speed limit. So, just making sure I get that all in so the minister knows. Uh, there's a, there is one road that, uh, Trunk 6, known as the Sunrise Trail, that I was told two years ago that would be, uh, work would be done on that road every year because it's a very important uh, roadway. And as we all know, if ongoing maintenance work is not kept up, then uh, it's, it's cheaper to do the ongoing maintenance than to have to rebuild a road and, and to have to pave it after it has to be rebuilt. So I noticed in the, in the five-year plan that there's no work scheduled on Trunk 6, and that road is getting quite broken down because it's used by trucks uh, daily, the salt trucks uh, coming from the salt mine and Pugwash, and many other trucks. And I'm wondering uh, if the minister could have somebody uh, from the department reassess and consider getting Trunk 6, Highway 6, put back on to make sure that there's maintenance being done so that road doesn't get broken down, that it will end up costing uh, more in the long run. The Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank the member for the question. And I'd also like to thank her for availing herself of the opportunity to come in and meet, meet with our people uh, to talk about the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, road work uh, in your area and uh, also observe that you have one of the longer lists of any of the MLAs that came to see us in the process and trunk six is on that uh, discussion that you had at that time so what is actually in the plan currently is trunk six but unfortunately not the sections that are in your particular riding or the section that you're talking about but it's being sequentially it's it's, it's a linear long linear piece runs uh, picto colchester counties and there's work being done in both picto and, and colchester i think Picto this year, and I, I'm not sure about the Colchester, but it's on the plan. Picto's next is 21, 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so uh, uh, we'd eventually get to uh, the piece that you're talking about, but we can go back and revisit that uh, and see if there's a way that we can uh, reevaluate what the uh, need is and look at moving it uh, uh, forward in the, prog in the program. The member for Cumberland North. Cumberland North. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for considering that. My concern is if the work is not done uh, before the road gets uh, broken down too much, that it's going to actually end up costing the province even more more money. And, and again, it's heavily, heavily travelled that that trunk six. Uh, the last thing that I will uh, bring today uh, is in the area of Cons Mills, uh, Hartford and Pugwash Junction area. So I don't know if the minister is aware of this, but certainly I've had numerous, numerous meetings with my area manager. I know that they're frustrated as well. There's a road that got washed out with Hurricane Dorian on September the 7th in uh, Cons Mills area. 
and unfortunately it wasn't repaired before October the 1st. So the area manager and myself have been told uh, that the work cannot be completed until after June the 1st due to regulations through environment and DFO. And I've asked the department to reconsider that. I've asked the environment to reconsider that because I know of other roads that culverts have been repaired and roads have been fixed in between the October 1st, June 1st window. And it may be a, a, a dirt road, it may be a gravel road, but it's a road that's an important, uh, important road to the area residents. There's farmers in that area that have to feed their cattle that are having to take a long, um, like four kilometer diversion twice a day, every day to feed the cattle. And uh, it just seems a shame when I know other roads in other areas have been repaired. I've been told the culverts are there waiting to be put in in one of the area uh, garages and so I just want to bring that to the floor today and see if there's anything, anything that the minister can do to get this road repaired in the Cons Mills Hansard area. It's, it's discussed either weekly or bi-weekly in my office with area residents. They're very frustrated because again it's been since, since September 7th. And then the last thing in similar area just up the road, there's a, a bridge on the Pugwash Junction Road that it was uh, put in sort of a temporary single lane bridge that the area residents were told around 15 years ago that it would, it would be replaced quickly. And that the challenge is a lot of them are fishermen, lobster fishermen, and they can't get their boats through. So they're having to, do, to take long areas. And again, it's just an inconvenience. And wondering if the minister might be able to look at and to see is that in the projected plans to have that bridge repaired? And if so, it's, is that something I'd be able to get information in the future to give to the area residents? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, thank the member for the for the question. Uh, the, we're very familiar with the issue uh, and the frustration around the uh, culvert replacement, and uh, uh, our staff shares that frustration. But we are clearly stymied by getting uh, a permit from DFO. Uh, sometimes there's some leniency in these instances. In this particular situation, they have stuck solid to the, uh, uh, the rules around October to June because of the fish presence in that particular uh, stream that is, in, that is involved there. So, uh, you know, barring them uh, uh, changing their mind about if we can go in there and work, we're, as you mentioned, the culverts are there, we're ready to go. Uh, but we need that permit, and uh, I know yourself and others in our department have been at them uh, to try and uh, and uh, get permission, but uh, has been uh, has been unsuccessful so far. And uh, it's cold comfort for you, but it happens right across our network, and uh, uh, we are subject to the uh, to the rules of DFO when it comes to uh, bridges and culverts, and also our own Department of Environment. Who, uh, 
treat us no differently than any particular uh, applicant that's there. Uh, with regard to the bridge, uh, uh, what we undertake to do is to get a specific indication of what, what that bridge is so we can identify it in our system uh, with Peter, if you could give it a, because uh, it may exist in our uh, world as a different uh, name than is in uh, the community, but we'd be willing to take a look at it. The only thing I would say, and we have this all over, all over the province, uh, a, 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 a bridge, and uh, um, probably that would have been an old iron bridge that was predated to one day the Bailey, the single-lane Bailey that is there now, uh, it, it, those, when, when those uh, fail, they, they, some of them are 100 years old. And 100 years ago, the bridges were of extreme importance because a detour of a couple of kilometers was massive if you're in a buggy, a horse and buggy. Less so today if you're in a XL150 four-wheel drive supercharged half-ton truck. So we have to make decisions about just what the uh, inconvenience is that is being imposed on an area by uh, making the detour permanent and not replacing the, uh, the bridge. We, I, I'm pretty pleased, because many of these bridges are obviously in rural areas, that we've been able to uh, come up with a solution. Some of them are, are Bailey uh, uh, bridges uh, and that, that are... are <clears throat> designated as temporary. Uh, I've got one in my riding, a temporary one's 30 years old now. Uh, that kind of is the way that they're going, because they're, they're, they're much cheaper uh, for us to install and solves the problem in most instances. I can appreciate the, uh, uh, the issue of the boats and the fishermen uh, getting a wide-bodied uh, boat through. That will cause them uh, some, uh, uh, some inconvenience. Uh, but it'd probably be only twice a year that they'd be hauling that boat to and from the launch. And uh, depending on what the, uh, the the length of the detour is, influences uh, what would be uh, uh, what would be happening. But we'll take a look at it. If you can identify it for our staff uh, specifically, then we will uh, we'll take a look and see. So before we go into questions, I'd like to do a quick introduction. Uh, in the West Gallery today, we are joined by one of the good ones, uh, HRM Councillor for Dartmouth Centre, Sam Austin. I ask everyone to give Sam a big round of applause and welcome. <laughs> Apparently, Sam is a political junkie to be sitting through this, so the member for Cumberland South. North. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for answering the questions that I brought to you today. And uh, my colleague from uh, Picto. No, I was just going to say he he just gave me some advice to let you know that I'm going to hound you. <laughs> <laughs> until the tolls are removed. Um, and uh, you could consider col using some of the toll money that's been collected over the last 24 years from the residents of Cumberland North to help cover some of the costs of the work that needs to be done. And thank, thank you to the Minister and those from the Department. I'll pass it over to my colleague from Cumberland South. The member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank the uh, the minister and the staff for being here today. Uh, just a quick couple notes on, on some comments uh, just passed. Maybe uh, uh, just a friendly suggestion. Uh, I don't know the minister that well. I've only been in the house for two years. But maybe the minister might want to speak louder to his MLA if he's got a 34-year-old temporary bridge. <laughs> um, Cobbequip Pass, I'm not going to re reiterate uh, the issues with Cumberland County with the Cobbequip Pass. Uh, my colleague just did it. Uh, Quick comment on the Collins Mills uh, washout. Um, just for Cumberland South, there's three family farms that are affected by that. So there's approximately probably eight jobs that are affected with that washout. And I certainly hope that uh, not everybody is driving around in a turbocharged truck. But uh, th these are people that are driving around, not, not in regular vehicles, tractors, that an eight kilometer detour is really affecting their day-to-day -day, uh, day -day commute, especially when uh, the season of, uh, of uh, new births for, for calves and things. Um, I, I've been here since 2018, uh, great relationship with the manager in the area. Um, almost everything that gets sent his way is take, taken care of in, uh, in a speedy, uh, speedy manner. It, uh, it's a great relationship. I think I've talked to you about that before, the minister. Uh, 
One of the issues that keeps presenting itself uh, with regular phone calls and, and has since the day after my election are the, uh, and I'm not looking for a response, I'm just throwing this out there today um, because letter after letter and even talking with the area manager on this, this one is the guardrails and all in, in different areas of Cumberland South, but specifically on the Highway 142, the connector between the 104 and the Spring, Spring Hill limits. Um, at some points in that area, the guardrails are almost lying on, on their sides. Um, but that's more of a comment, not looking for a commitment or anything like that. I just want to utilize this opportunity to, to speak up about that. Um, in, in my presentation before estimates this, this, uh, this afternoon, I had an ample opportunity to bring up different roads um, that are documented to, to the area manager, um, some concerns concerns that way. Um, I, I, do, I don't want to take other time from, uh, from a lot of other people that uh, may not share the same relationship with their area manager that, uh, that I do. Um, but one specific thing, uh, in 2000, 2018, just shortly after my election, uh, there, there was a sinkhole issue in Oxford. And uh, following that sinkhole issue, uh, then MP Bill Casey and I were very active in, in trying to secure funding and, and testing and, and, and getting the answers out. And uh, uh, MP Casey and I both were sitting in, in, in Oxford for the, for the final report of what was done in that private property, which is known as Lyons property at the time. And we were, we were very disheartened, both of us, to find out that uh, the TIR was not at that table during, during some of those briefings. They were initially, but during the testing, they weren't involved when, when energy and mines were there, lands and forestry were there. There, there was a lot of other, other support. And out of that report, I tabled it last year, and, and, uh, and the minister, Mr. Chair, the minister uh, committed to doing testing um, at exit 6 on, on Highway 104. Um, we, we heard different times that the, uh, the report would be back uh, the end of December, then we heard the end of January. So I guess I'm here, uh, I, I understand from media that have called me as, uh, as late of, as of yesterday, they still have not had a response from the Minister's Department. And uh, as the MLA, I'm, I'm looking to see wh where we're at with that report. It was taxpayers' money that did the report and in, in, the, uh, in recognizing the uh, motorist safety. Curious to what that report uh, has to say and, and will that be available anytime soon? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Welcome. Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, and I can understand the uh, uh, anxiety that uh, would uh, be around the uh, uh, reception of the report. First, let me say that uh, uh, you know I feel very bad for the uh, Lions uh, Club uh, there. Uh, we know the Lions do great work, and it's so unfortunate that that. Uh, subsidence occurred uh, on their property and really impaired their uh, their operation in the process. However, really, it's not on TIR property. It's not in our right of way, and it's uh, uh, not something that we would be able to uh, assist in, and other than offering technical advice, uh, perhaps. Uh, which, of course, would be coming through the other two departments that you mentioned were uh, present at the session. Uh, on the, re with regard to the uh, study, uh, the uh, Harborside Engineering uh, undertook that uh, work for us. Uh, it's, I'm informed that a draft was received uh, recently uh, in the department and uh, some clarification was requested and that uh, the uh, clarification was, so it was returned to them and a second draft was uh, received just in the last couple of days uh, from Harborside. I haven't uh, seen that and I'm not sure that our senior management have either yet, uh, but uh, we will be reviewing that and then uh, once uh, everybody understands completely what's being said, uh, the report would be uh, accepted and released, and that would probably be in, uh, by the late spring that we would have that uh, available for, uh, for you and for public viewing. The member for Cumberland South. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I thank the minister for that response. I, I look forward to that report. And uh, as, you, as you can well imagine, you, you did state the anxiety uh, that people may have in the area, and, uh, and, and I am asked almost daily of, of what's going on. So I look forward to that report. And uh, just recognizing the time that's left uh, for the PC caucus, uh, I, I'd really like to take this opportunity. It, uh, it, it, it was a very busy fall and, and an early winter in, in the area. Um, with the cleanups of, uh, of Hurricane Dorian and, and a quick snowfall that closed down the pass in, in, in the fall. And uh, I, I just want to recognize the dedication of the staff of, uh, of TIR and, uh, and the good work and the services that we do receive, not just in my area. We, we hear from the MLAs here and, and of course, your, yourself. You certainly bolster uh, the, the, the team behind you and, uh, and a hat off, hats off to uh, you, your staff, and, and all the ones that are out on those highways. So thank you very much, Chair, and we'll turn the time back over to the NDP. Time has expired for the Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, I now pass it on to the member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> lovely to be back. Um, uh, it uh, apparently, uh, one of my colleagues from the Cons Conservative Party talked about the Isthmus of Chignecto. Uh, and I want to just be able to say Isthmus of Chignecto a couple times, so I'm going to ask you um, uh, about the budget, the amounts budgeted for this year for that work. Um, I'm, apparently, you've already been asked about the timelines, and uh, so wondering about anything budgeted for the work uh, at, at the Isthmus of Chignecto this year. The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the member for the question. Uh, just uh, to, to be clear, the stage we're at now with the uh, with the repairs uh, intended, the analysis stage that we have for the uh, isthmus uh, involves a partnership with the province of New Brunswick, ourselves, and the federal government. Uh, there isn't anything budgeted in the current budget that you have in front of you uh, for that work because the approximately $750,000 that is our contribution to the study uh, process uh, is in the current fiscal year and has been dispersed to the province of New Brunswick because they're the lead on it, so we give it to them. They're, uh, with our uh, guidance, uh, are uh, spending, the, spending the money and the Fed, uh, the Fed money too. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the study is, is uh, underway and that will determine then the, the magnitude of the effort that's going to be required to uh, provide the protection for the, for the instruments, the armor stone, etc. The member for Dartmouth North. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, does the department have a plan to transition its vehicle assets toward low or zero carbon emission vehicles?
the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, we do have a, uh, we're part of a committee uh, that's associated with the Sustainable uh, Development Goals Act uh, and the climate change issue that uh, would uh, analyze what the applications might be in our uh, department for uh, uh, for, for, for getting to electrification, as an example, in our smaller vehicle fleet. Uh, say, for instance, our, our uh, half tons and vans and that sort of thing. The network for charging stations is just uh, uh, building up across the province, though it's, uh, you know, I'm seeing it in, in different areas. I've got several in my own uh, very rural riding. Uh, and that we're part of that move, which is generally in government uh, from all the departments to see what the application is uh, uh, for uh, uh, getting off of diesel or gasoline. Uh, obviously, for the big gear that we have, like a salt truck, uh, I don't know if there's such a thing available, electric. Uh, salt salt truck I couldn't couldn't say eventually we'll get there but one thing that is available uh, in and is used uh, fairly extensively in the United States is liquefied natural gas stations which uh, sort of is the you know the next best thing to electrical uh, in terms of emission control and that <clears throat> liquefied natural gas is uh, system is used in uh, uh, the transportation business with tractor trailers uh, for the tractor trailer application and is used extensively for uh, for locomotives and rail railroads so uh, we uh, uh, I, I can't say that we're looking at that in in the department at, at Miller Lake yet but uh, we are part of the movement that is within government and uh, within our department to look at ways uh, to uh, work uh, on uh, on the climate change change file, uh, but I will undertake on my own to see if we are analyzing the liquefied natural gas option, uh, because we're hopeful that we'll soon have liquefied natural gas in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Member for Dartmouth South, North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, great, uh, and wondering. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand that the charging station system is a is a kind of a that's a big chunk of it, obviously, right now. Uh, when I was speaking with the Minister of Energy last night, he mentioned that he had driven an electric car from here to Sydney and on sixteen dollars or something. And but uh, um, he also said he plugged in the car wrong one time, so it took a lot longer to get there than it would have, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's. Uh, it's. It would be great to see the government leading the way in these things. If we, if you know, we need to reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions. Government is perfectly poised to be leaders in this. Um, so you know, I'd go further and and say it would be great if we looked as well at government buildings, new buildings, and um, existing buildings. Uh, you know, being part of um, the uh, the the. <laughs> The program, which is whose name escapes me right now, but the one that we just passed the bill about last night, <laughs> the uh, the federal government is making use of the of the um, this newly available green energy. It would be great if, the, if if Nova Scotia was doing the same thing. And you, as the minister of transportation, or the minister of transportation, would be a great leader in that. Um, so, uh, just a sort of a B part. Are there any plans in the Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal uh, to work towards electrified public transit? And I know that often public transit is a municipal thing, but I know the government has uh, the provincial government has a, a stake. So, just curious to know if that's on the on the talks in the talks.
The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank the member for the question. Just to uh, uh, deal with the mention that she made in her preamble about um, buildings, new buildings, uh, I want to point out that we have made a decision uh, to uh, fire six major uh, government facilities around the province uh, with wood uh, uh, with wood fired uh, boilers uh, uh, pellets uh, I think or chips I'm not sure if it's chips or pellets I, I would say that in the new uh, school that I'm very proud of in, in uh, Sheet Harbor that there is actually uh, it's a 31 million dollar school and it is uh, being being fired by uh, pellets by wood pellets in that particular instance but that one predates the decision that was taken recently to do some of the larger facilities around the province. So in terms of getting off of uh, uh, um, oil, uh, the, then we are making a step in that direction and we'll probably have more of that in the, uh, more of that in the, in the pipeline. In the, uh, under the ICIP program with the federal government, uh, there's a tremendous commitment to uh, uh, zero emission um, vehicles by I think 2023 I believe uh, which is creeping up uh, pretty pretty quick uh, they have uh, 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 expressed a, a desire that we uh, that they want to uh, uh, purchase and assist with the purchase of 5,000 uh, buses both school and transit uh, starting uh, right away and they have they have funded the urban transit process very significantly in the uh, uh, in in their uh, their budget, uh, particularly through the green stream as we uh, as we call it. Uh, from our perspective, if you look at the the transit system that you mentioned uh, <clears throat> here. There's really only three well-articulated transit systems in the uh, in the province, and they are municipally driven. And so the municipalities uh, within uh, that, that that these systems exist in are the ones that make the decisions about uh, how they see their evolution and access to the green stream funds to uh, to uh, uh, change from from uh, fossil fuels to uh, electricity. Uh, we encourage that, but we don't have the decision-making process there. It's, for instance, in your situation, it's up to uh, Metro Transit to decide uh, what it is that they want to do. And I uh, think I recall that there was just a, uh, a prominent municipal councillor introduced in the gallery. So I would suggest you maybe have a conversation with him. The member from Dartmouth North. Uh, well, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I want to turn our attention now to school capital for a few minutes. Um, when the government eliminated uh, democratically elected school boards, they also eliminated public input in the school site selection process. Siting of a school used to be guided by a board level site selection committee that included SAC members, school board members, the African Nova Scotian representative, and the Mi'kmaq representative, and, the, and members of the municipal council. The revised Education Act regulations that came into effect April 1, 2018, eliminated any requirement for community involvement and consultation. The site selection process is now entirely an internal government process. In response to a Freedom of Information request, that we have learned as recently as last year that the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal was using a manual for school site selection that was updated in last in 1999. The correspondence in the FOI reveals a general state of confusion about how to proceed with new school builds. So um, I'm wondering if the minister can explain if there is now an updated manual for school site selection to guide the work of the department, and if there is, is it possible for it to be provided?
Minister. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, I'm going to go down a bit of a, of a narrow road here because for the most part, uh, your inquiry uh, would be better directed at the Department of Education who control the site selection uh, process. So in the role that we, our department plays in the uh, uh, education or the site selection process is the Department of Education is the client and we supply to that client technical information such as geotechnical, what's under a proposed site, what's the geology uh, there, we might drill and test and uh, make sure there's no sinkholes uh, under the, uh, under the uh, school, especially in a place like Spring Hill if we, we decide to go up there. Uh, and uh, uh, the issues around traffic studies, is it a busy street, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So we supply that information back to the department. We're, we don't uh, rely on uh, or use a, 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 a manual, I'm not sure what particular it is that you're talking about. Uh, we use engineering standards uh, to make the decisions that we take. But that is all information, technical information for the most part, uh, that we would investigate and supply to the client, which is the Department of Education, who would then pull the trigger on uh, A, B, or C sites uh, and, and uh, that uh, sort of uh, uh, that sort of decision is taken, essentially is taken by them. In other words, we do the scan, uh, we prevent, present the technical uh, information, they make the decision. <clears throat> the member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it's um, funny you should say that, or funny that the minister should say that, because we asked these questions in estimates to the Minister of Education, and the Minister of Education told us to ask the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal. So here we are. And uh, we can't go back. Well, erroneous? erroneous? Hmm. Um, here we go. He said, she said. Um, so I'm going to continue on, uh, but the manual that I refer to, um, I mean, I, I don't know what it's called, but apparently there is a manual from 1999 that is used. Um, um, in any case, uh, in the same package, in the FOI package that we uh, submitted, there's an email about a meeting between a staff member from the Department of Education. It's great that you're both here, by the way. And a TIR, um, and, and someone from TIR with a member of Bedford sorry, the member for Bedford, about the sighting of a P-9 school. The email states, quote, at the end of the conversation, the agreement was that we would have two basic potential approaches, end quote, and I can table that letter. Is it a part of the TIR school site selection process to meet with the MLA of the area to determine a list of possible sites for new school builds? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, on a practical basis, obviously, that's an MLA's uh, role in life, is to be involved in the heartbeat of the community, which, of course, is what the schools uh, represent. Uh, and uh, uh, I know in my own instance, uh, I can certainly tell you that uh, I was in hot pursuit for several years uh, of anybody that would talk to me in government uh, around the, uh, the, sheet, the new school in Sheet Harbour and conveying the wishes of the community, uh, which is the role, I think, of the M MLA to the, the various pieces of government that decide this. Now, at the time, there were school boards uh, in, in the instance of the Sheet Harbour uh, uh, decision and, and uh, uh, build, which of course meant that there was another party in there that had to be involved, but it, it would be my experience that that would be a common practice across parties uh, where the MLA would be uh, uh, anxious and involved and doing their really their their, their job, which is to uh, convey the uh, the desires of the community uh, to the uh, uh, to the powers that be that make these kinds of decisions. The member for Dartmouth North. 
Well, I have to say to the minister that I absolutely 100% agree, agree with him. It's interesting, however, uh, that I am the MLA for Dartmouth North, and uh, just uh, several months ago, there was an announcement of a wonderful new purchase of Newbridge Academy for the CSAP. No one ever told me about it. No one told me there was a discussion to be had. No one told me there was a meeting to be had about it. Uh, it is in my writing, and I heard about it at the same time as all of the other CSAP parents did, which I am one of, by the way. Uh, and so, uh, although I am like terrifically excited that my children will get to go to a brand new school, I would have loved to have been consulted. And boy, oh boy, I really would love to be have an invitation to the opening of that new school. So I'll just say that right now. Um, uh, but you know, I get your point. I get the point of the minister. Uh, so. Um, Sometimes I think, though, that uh, it's possible that uh, certain MLAs maybe get forgotten when there are meetings to be had and uh, decisions to be made. Um, so, in, in, I'm just going to um, I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague from Dartmouth South for one minute, uh, who wants to ask a, a question. You, do, do you need this? Yeah, sure. Okay, and I'll be back in three. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and, you know, in the case of Newbridge Academy, which my um, colleague was talking about, um, as she said, I think the idea that an MLA would actively advocate for a school in their constituency where one was required, of course, makes perfect sense. Um, similarly, that they would advocate for renovations. But if an MLA has no inkling that a brand new multi-million dollar school is going to be purchased in their constituency, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to reach out. And so I think that the point um, that uh, the member for Dartmouth North was making that it was that it might have been nice for the department to reach out uh, to members across the aisle in that kind of situation, um, not just on that side of the house. But I want to ask a couple more questions about Newbridge Academy and in particular um, the renovations. So our understanding was that Newbridge, uh, the purchase of Newbridge included a $10 million construction contract for Dora Construction. Um, and I guess my question is, what was the process by which that was cleared through procurement? Um, I have to confess, I don't know. The, I'm not super familiar with the procurement rules, but it seems odd that a $10 million construction project on a school would not be tendered, uh, but would go um, to a preferential um, proponent. So maybe the minister could comment on that. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank the member, uh, both members for the question on Newbridge Academy. Uh, in knowing how uh, sometimes government is uh, a little bit um, clumsy, uh, awkward, <laughs> Uh, yeah, all of those wonderful uh, uh, adjectives, but at the end of the day, for the most part, 
produces an accurate outcome. Unfortunately, there's a time lag in many instances. I have to tell you that I was so proud of our government, I was so proud of the CSAP when it came to Newbridge Academy because we were able to move in a nimble manner to capture a uh, rare opportunity, which was to uh, secure a built-for-purpose school at a premium price, including the, uh, the $10 million uh, dollar, uh, internal renovation, which was part of the end product. Uh, it, it was like, uh, you know, you're leasing a car and you put extra stuff on it, then that's what you, uh, you pay. Uh, we actually did run the, uh, the, the process by procurement, uh, and they were happy with the outcome. And uh, <clears throat> because that facility, I think, will serve the CSAP uh, long uh, uh, for many, uh, many generations. It's in a fabulous location. It's got great egress, access and egress. It is located across the street from that fabulous facility, that sports facility. I'm not just sure what that's called. And it even has a nice hotel next door to it now where parents can come and watch their uh, their kids uh, go uh, play sports or, or play to the, uh, uh, if they need to go and uh, talk to the teachers in the school. Very, very convenient uh, situation. And we acquired it at a premium price. And in, in actually in getting that too, we also deferred a huge unknown cost that would have been associated with locating that facility on the peninsula, which was part of the process. But the CSAP, or part of the vision at the time, CSAP has uh, uh, said, uh, and, and more recently, uh, statements have been made that there will not be a school on the, uh, built on the peninsula. CSAP is, 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 is fine with that. So at the end of the day, we came out with a uh, facility that will uh, serve the needs, we feel, serve the needs of the, of the people. The renovation is uh, proceeding on schedule. It's being done by the people who built, did the building. It's not, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, um, so they have an inside track on what is needed. And it is, we're, we're buying the finished product. So the, the, the relevant uh, 10 million uh, is uh, part of the purchase price of the process. In addition to that, and uh, I understand uh, how you would feel if all of a sudden, boom, this thing dropped in the middle of your, your riding, but this was, a, uh, was a, an agreement of purchase and sale. We had to move very quickly anyway, as uh, you know, in real estate transactions, uh, for an attractive property like that, there were several suitors. And uh, it was uh, subject to non-disclosure agreements with the vendor uh, in terms of uh, being able to uh, uh, access the uh, property uh, until the, the, the deal was finally uh, inked. And that, would, that decision would, would, would have been a cabinet decision uh, to, to make that acquisition. And those, uh, th that cabinet uh, uh, minute would be available for public viewing. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to just try this one more time, and if it doesn't work, then I'm happy to yield the floor back to my colleague. So um, I think we've, we've, we've resolved the issue of the school landing boom in the middle of Dartmouth North and the you know, expediency of a, of a real estate transaction. Sorry, while well, I put my earring back on. Um, but uh, the question that I asked the minister was about the procurement process or lack thereof. Um, so the minister mentioned that there were several suitors. He had to act quickly. The $10 million was part of the purchase and sale. Um, in fact, I think that the government was accused of uh, an unlevel playing field in the purchase of that building, as I recall, because of this $10 million sweetheart renovation deal that was offered as part of that purchase and sale. And so that brings us back to my original question, which is, um, I, th I believe the minister said that procurement was happy with the outcome, but procurement from, from my perspective is as much about process as outcome. So, so what was the process? H how was it that $10 million of t a $10 million construction contract cannot seemingly have any process at all? Now I'm done. <laughs>
being nice would have been the wrong word. We've been extremely generous to it. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, indeed, we did uh, 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 take the, the matter to procurement, and they uh, felt that this was an agreement of purchase and sale, that we were buying an end product. We weren't making a tender, uh, public tender in the process, and that's uh, uh, how we uh, ended, uh, ended up there. Of course, at the same time, we did do our own due diligence in the form of appraisals, in the form of ghost uh, estimates for the uh, projected uh, uh, renovation. And I would agree with the, uh, with the member that this was a sweetheart deal, a sweetheart deal for the citizens of Nova Scotia. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, the decision to, uh, uh, about where to build a school usually uh, should include or does include community voices. Consultation should be given. However, the Muscadabit and Area Chamber of Commerce has been trying, uh, Muscadabit Harbour and Area Chamber of Commerce has been trying to engage in this process for more than a year. Uh, in the case of the Eastern Shore District High School, a written report on the evaluation of the existing school site is expected this month. So first of all, I'm wondering if you're able to table that report. Minister? Yeah, we haven't received the, the report as of yet, uh, Madam Chair. We don't, we don't have that report to table. The member for Dartmouth North. Uh, a recent letter sent by the Minister of Education to the President of the Mus Muscadabit Harbour and Area Chamber of Commerce indicates that community engagement only occurs when there is a situation where there are two or more viable sites. So my first question about that is, how is that short list of sites determined? And how, like how, when you were talking, when the minister was talking about, um, you know, the, the TIR is responsible for, you know, doing the geo um, technical surveys and all of those things. Um, how, how is that shortlist decided upon? How is it decided upon which sites get the technical analysis to be put on, you know, a, 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 a shorter list? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the member for the, for the question. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, the, uh, the uh, engagement that we have with the Department of Education, who again are the client and we're uh, the service provider, as it were, uh, the first thing that we do according to their uh, policy is analyze the existing site uh, to see if it is remains feasible. Normally, uh, you know, and I go back to Sheet Harbor again, uh, we went on the existing site. Uh, it was a challenge uh, in, in, at first blush, but it, uh, that school, is, which is opening in September, is uh, on the existing site. And there's obvious reasons for that. First of all, the community often um, is used to, to that uh, uh, site. Uh, certainly in the rural areas, uh, uh, that would tend to work better than maybe in the urban areas where population shifts would have, would have occurred uh, so that over time, over a period of 50 years, 40, 50 years, the populations would have shifted so that 
what was the appropriate location uh, in the past may not be the appropriate location now because of that very uh, that very reason. We've got sections of Halifax Region Municipality that are on the, the rocket as far as uh, the uh, increase in, in uh, population uh, goes. So what we do is, uh, and is what, what our uh, request is from the department is to supply an analysis of the existing site then that study is made available to the various stakeholders to the community the mla uh, any interested parties in the uh, area uh, to see if there's any other sites that are worth uh, investigating and i think that's the process that we're at here and we haven't received that full report as of yet not for the existing site, not for the existing site but that's number one uh, okay. that we would do the member for Dartmouth North. Okay, so uh, I, I understand what you're what the minister is saying. I'm trying to square the two things, though. So, um, the department comes in and does a, first of all does an analysis of the existing site to see if that's possible. If it's not possible, then other sites are looked at. So. Um, I guess my the thing that I'm getting confused about is if if community consultation like basically how without community consultation how do does the department get the input from the community about what sites might be good you said very, the minister said various stakeholders the MLA the community but if the community only gets consulted when there are two or more viable sites already selected that doesn't seem to square with me so i'm just i'm just trying to figure out i really am trying to figure out how it actually works um, is it that the department does a bunch of work to determine a couple of viable sites and then those are presented to the community? Or is there a community consultation that's supposed to happen so that the community can say, look, I've got this great piece of land, or you know, look, the, because of you know, this, this thing that's happening in our community, it makes only better, you know, great sense to do it here. So which comes first? It it's feels like a bit of a chicken and egg thing, but I think it actually, it's, it's not that, um, it's not that even. So I'd love to just hear exactly the process. Thanks. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And again, we take our lead from the uh, uh, client, in this instance, the Department of Education, uh, and we rely heavily on the information that they uh, get from the regional education centers. Uh, and if the net is going to be cast uh, wider because the existing site does not have the criteria that uh, the Department of Education has not not our criteria their criteria then um, the net is cast a bit larger other sites would be identified and uh, analyzed and once they are uh, qualified then the community would be uh, uh, invited into the uh, to the process yes yeah. that's that's based on the fact if the, if the, the sites were of equal merit the member for Dartmouth North. Okay, great. Um, so getting back to the CSAP for a second, um, and we may have kind of touched on this, but I just want to confirm that that's what I was hearing. A school that has been included in the capital, the government's capital plan for a number of years is a CSAP high school for the Halifax Peninsula. Once a school is included in the capital campaign, capital campaign, capital plan, can you explain the reasons why it would be removed? What factors would be considered? And how is TIR involved in that decision process? So we know that the, the Halifax Peninsula one has been removed, or, or I don't know if it's been removed, but it's just not being done right now. Um, yeah, how, so what are the reasons why it would be removed? What factors are considered, and how is TIR involved in the process?
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, for clarity, uh, the uh, acquisition of the uh, new bridge uh, has uh, eliminated the need for uh, the high school portion uh, that was destined for the peninsula, but the P to 6 is still uh, on and it appears in the budget uh, uh, in, the, in, the current, in the current year. Uh, the decisions around on or off are not decisions that we would take. There's, those are decisions uh, by uh, the Department of Education. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so for when new schools are built, uh, what are the requirements for there to be a kitchen or other food preparation space uh, and a cafeteria? The Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question. Uh, uh, we're getting into the technical uh, area now, which uh, I can easily get lost in, but there is a standard called a DC350, which is the standard that determines the um, footprint of the school that would be considered. Uh, it's, it, there's a fairly detailed analysis there, and we would be happy to get back to you with the detail as to how that uh, actually works out. Uh, my staff will undertake to, to get that information for you. The member for Dartmouth North. Uh, yes, thank you, Minister. That would be great. Um, of course, I guess the reason I'm asking is because uh, you know, there's so much uh, emphasis uh, these days, and I hope into the future, on um, community food programs, school food programs. Uh, but we know that there are many schools that actually don't have the ability for students to, um, th there's no kitchen, basically, or, or, you know, so there's no way to, for kids to learn uh, how to prepare food, how to share food, that kind of thing. And we know that those programs are proven to be uh, excellent uh, uh, programs for teaching kids all kinds of things. Uh, uh, I know at Harborview Elementary, for instance, um, in Dartmouth North, we now have a massive greenhouse growing food all through the winter. We have a beautiful garden behind uh, the school and uh, the kitchen. There is a small kitchen there, but it needs a bunch of things. Um, and so if thinking about building new schools, uh, it would be great if those, you know, obviously that that was uh, incorporated into the design. So speaking of design, um, the concept of universal design is the design of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their size, age, ability, or disability. Uh, what are the requirements for new school builds to incorporate the principles of universal design?
Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank the member for the question, which sort of takes us back to the earlier question of the DC 350 standard, where um, much of the uh, these things reside as an example for the standards for accessibility, uh, the gender neutrality of the washrooms as an example. Uh, we also uh, strive to get at least lead silver on the uh, uh, envelopes uh, for, the, for the schools. Uh, but I think if we can get that information uh, for you on the uh, DC 350 standard, that that would also answer this particular question. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you. Thank the minister for that question. Um, in looking at new school builds, are appropriate pre-primary spaces part of the planning for those schools? The minister. Yes, they are. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, thanks for that answer. Um, does your department keep track of how many, does the department keep track of how many schools in the province are over capacity or over the number of students allowed based on fire code? If so, how many schools are over capacity and if not, who does track that information? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. That would be an education department uh, uh, question. I'm not able to answer that. They would track that information. The member for Dartmouth North. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to move on and talk about um, accessibility for a moment. Speaking of accessibility, Nova Scotia has the highest rate of disability in Canada. How is the work of the accessibility directorate connected to the work of the department? And how are you incorporating accessibility into infrastructure builds and maintenance? And of course now I'm moved on, I'm, I'm moving on past schools and um, yeah, in terms of all new builds. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the very relevant question. Uh, yes, we have a close uh, uh, commitment to uh, accessibility in all our public buildings. We're working very closely with the committee that's been struck on accessibility that best informs us what the, uh, uh, what the best practices are uh, for uh, uh, building the accessibility concept into everything that we do when we, we get involved either in, a, in a, a, a new build or a extensive renovation. And um, we're confident that we can reach the 2030 goals with, with regard to accessibility uh, in public buildings, provincial buildings in the province. The <clears throat> member for Dartmouth North. Okay, great. So in the 2018-19 uh, Minister's Annual Report on Accessibility, it indicates that TIR is completing a review of all existing facilities owned by the Government of Nova Scotia. Wondering if the Minister can provide an update on that review and if he is able to table any of the results. The Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank the member for the question. Uh, we are working on the, uh, on the template, as it were, for uh, the accessibility standards that uh, uh, we will eventually be fully adopting throughout the uh, department, but we don't have anything tangible that we could table at this time. The member for Dartmouth North. Um, any, uh, and sorry, I, 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 I heard the minister say that he has nothing to table at the time, but is there any sense of a timeline on when that will be ready? Yeah. 
shape will help him out. Right hand is half an hour, which is per year. And it's not what's up there. We really have just enough to check this to some inspection of the building. The Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Member, for the question. We don't really actually have a deadline, as it were. Uh, we're uh, um, um, sowing the accessibility culture into everything that we do from a building perspective that we have responsibility for and uh, uh, obviously are working towards that 2030 uh, goal. I recognize the member for King South on an introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to draw my colleagues' attention to the East Gallery, where we're joined by a good friend of mine, Mr. David Daniels from Wolfville. David's an avid watcher of politics, particularly at the municipal level, um, and he also has done tremendous work with Legal Aid Society, and I was honoured to be in the presence of him when he became a new Canadian about two or three years ago. So please welcome our, my friend David Daniels. I recognize the member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Moving on to the siting of public buildings, not schools, but other public buildings. The Licensed Professional Planners Association of Nova Scotia, LPPANS, has requested a meeting with the minister on three occasions with no response. The dates that requests were made were November 29th, 2019, December 19th, 2019, and January 10th, 2020. Will the minister agree to reach out to uh, the LPPANS to schedule a meeting? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank the member for the question. That uh, request, may, uh, I, I don't know if it has reached uh, my desk. Uh, I don't know why it, it wouldn't, uh, but I will undertake the check and see uh, where it's at. And uh, uh, my uh, philosophy is, is an open door philosophy. Uh, uh, and uh, though it might take a little while to get a time with a busy schedule. Uh, we're, we meet with everybody that we can. That takes the time to uh, uh, to uh, come meet with, uh, with us if what they want to talk about is something that we, we uh, have involvement with and can help them with. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank the minister for that. I mean, um is the best thing to do for the organization to maybe contact the minister's EA and set something up that way? Okay. Last spring, our caucus tabled a bill respecting the location of facilities and structures that provide government services to the public. The goal was to encourage, encourage government services to be places in places that are accessible by active and public transportation and to promote the imp improvement of the social, economic, environmental, and cultural connections of the communities in which the facilities and structures are located. Can the minister provide an update on where the department is in terms of considering establishing a policy on siting public buildings, which is Bill 115?
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and for the member. Uh, we're not prolific uh, uh, builders uh, of buildings other than salt domes uh, and uh, plow sheds, uh, and normally those are uh, buildings that would go on existing uh, strategically located bases uh, and could actually be order time has lapsed for the NDP we'll move over to the PC caucus for one hour I recognize the honorable member for Inverness thank you madam chair and uh, thank you minister and staff for the opportunity um, <clears throat> first question I have has to do with the uh, the roundabout proposed for Wicagama and um, the question is, uh, would you consider having a, a public meeting uh, to go over the design with the community? I know there's been some consultation. Um, there's, there's some feeling in the community. I think a lot of people are happy with the idea, uh, but there is some concern. There's some truckers have contacted me and uh, said they're concerned about the footprint and if it's going to be big enough, uh, if it's going to allow trucks to pass through easily. Uh, concerns about Newfoundland uh, ferry truck traffic, um, that sort of thing, and and also, I think, uh, and there's, I don't know, unless you do construction at night, it's difficult to avoid this. But I predict this summer, uh, if it's if it moves ahead, I know it's planned to go ahead, that uh, there could be some traffic issues during construction. All of that, it might help if there's a meeting with the community. Uh, to address concerns and uh, and to maybe make things uh, maybe th make things go more smoothly. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, we're quite excited about that uh, 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 roundabout that we're, we're putting in there. That's a busy intersection. Uh, I think uh, Vise sort of had to disappear to uh, get it in place there, but the word that I have is that we do have ample uh, real estate there, quite a large uh, uh, a section that will enable us to put a, a, an accommodating uh, roundabout in there, which the design <clears throat> folks are saying will take whatever sized uh, truck uh, comes at it and large loads. Uh, but the uh, community is perfectly justified in uh, looking to uh, to receive a um, to be part of to be informed as to what's going on so we'll undertake to have our folks uh, set up a, uh, a, a session where uh, the community can be invited in so that they can look at the at the plans uh, and uh, uh, understand what it is that we're doing the member for Inverness Thank you, Minister, and, and I'm, I'm excited about that, that project as well, and uh, I can tell you now that uh, if there's discussion in the room, I'll do what I can to help uh, to ensure that it proceeds uh, in a way that's positive and, and whatnot. So um, the, the other one is uh, the Port Hastings Rotary, and I know there's future plans for that. Uh, I know there's been nothing announced, uh, but... Um, same thing there. It's it's a major change. Um, would uh, would the department be willing to have some some uh, a meeting with the community to show them the design when the time comes uh, to work with the first responders to uh, uh, people who own properties immediately around the area? And uh, I know municipal governments have been have been wanting to get involved as well. Um, I, I do, though, recognize this is provincial jurisdiction, and uh, province owns the land, they own the highways, they, this is really provincial business, but 
Uh, I think it's also an opportunity to improve the look of the entrance under the island. Would the uh, minister of the department consider when the time comes having a meeting with the public uh, for the same purpose? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, there is movement on the uh, uh, proposed roundabout for there. The staff are in the field uh, picking up the surveys, depending, determining what the parameters are uh, to be able to inform the design. And it's not pegged yet in the plan, but it is in the, uh, it's caught in the process and is in uh, for, for a future development. Uh, but uh, I can assure the member that at the time, uh, and we've heard from the mayor of uh, Port Hawkesbury on the matter too, that we will involve the, uh, the community in the consultation once we have something tangible that we can show them. So yes. The member for Inverness. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister, for that. Um, the, the next question, I'm going to move to uh, just a brief question on, um, on the Halifax uh, Stanfield Airport. I notice there were five million for cargo terminal upgrades. That was in the uh, a budget update. Um, well, it was actually in the public accounts, dated March 31st, which I think that came out in August. Um, but I, my, but beyond that, I guess, and this may be something that could be provided even at a later date. But I'm curious to see um, how much capital investment uh, was put into the Halifax Airport over the last 20 years. Um, or even over a period that, uh, and that my purpose in asking the question, there's been some discussion on airports in my area, and uh, it's, uh, I'm just curious to see what the province has been investing in the Halifax Airport, and also if there's been any investment in the Sydney Airport, and I expect it would all be public information anyway, but I'm just wondering if, if that could be uh, provided over, the, say, the last 20 years. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank the member for the question. Uh, uh, to deal with the second part first, we will undertake to try and uh, go back 20 years, uh, do our best to acquire that, and it'll take a little bit of while for us to uh, uh, to get that. But I, I can, my own personal observation in the last uh, seven years is that the only money I know about going is the, the $5 million that you uh, mentioned. And uh, that is was a contribution that was made for the new cargo uh, handling facility, which is under construction there now, which I think the capital cost was $37 million. We put in five, and that trigger, triggered 
an $18 million contribution from the federal government under the Trade Corridors Fund, which is the same fund that gave us $90 million for the 104 expansion. And then, of course, the airport put up the difference uh, uh, themselves, and that particular project is, is well underway. So uh, <clears throat> that airport has been critical, particularly to our fishery uh, export uh, opportunity in the, uh, uh, in the province. Uh, the uh, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, amount of lobster that's flown out of there is quite amazing, and I think that's what this new facility is to stiffen that situation and improve the ability to handle that uh, cargo there. So it's a very important uh, uh, part of our, uh, our economic fabric in the province, as really as, as all our airports, including Sydney and uh, Port <clears throat> the Port Hawkesbury Airport, uh, and, and even the little Marguerite grass strip that's there. I don't know if that's even used anymore, but uh, a little bit, yeah, it's still, still there. You know, and there's an airport in Yarmouth, there's the airport in Digby, in the valley. There's a, there's a DeBert, there's a facility there. So, you know, the, uh, the, the whole concept of, of the importance of the air uh, travel is, is not lost on uh, the transportation network in the province. But we will undertake to find that back information for you. It might take a little while, we'll get it to you. The member for Inverness. Thank you for that, Minister. I appreciate that. Um, there's, I, I just have one other question, and there's, there's one item I'm going to hand deliver it because I promised I would do it. Uh, it's a, um, a petition from some residents of, of Blackstone near Mabu, and uh, it, it can't be tabled in the House because, uh, because of the way the, the uh, statement is written. But I told them I, I would hand deliver it, <coughs> so I'll do that. And, um, my, my last uh, question is. Um, it's just on road maintenance. I know, I think in the budget it's up 50%. Um, at least that's what I seem to infer from looking at the numbers. And I'm just wondering if that would, what that would translate on average for a, for a county or a constituency or for an area in terms of maybe X number of kilometers of gravel or uh, maintenance paving or, uh, or dollar amounts in terms of overall maintenance work, which might be for ditching, graveling. Uh, brush cutting and so on. Thank you. It's all going to my constituency. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, the, uh, of course, the expenditures uh, would be associated with the presence of the, uh, of the asset of the road in the particular location. So that's what drives the uh, requirement for maintenance uh, and, and also for capital uh, 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 expenditure. 
uh, as an example uh, for the gravel road program, and you probably know better than I what roads might be uh, due for this year, but we're very happy with that program. We've done 400 and, and, um, 52, 442 kilometers so far under that program. We've got 152 scheduled for this, uh, for this season. So uh, uh, I have been just thrilled as a rural uh, MLA like yourself uh, with uh, the focus that has been brought to the gravel road and the citizens are pretty happy too in my experience and in, uh, in my riding uh, for the work that we've been able to uh, get done. So that uh, in that particular instance obviously they're, 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 uh, that tends to be an expenditure in the more rural uh, parts of the of the province, and so that money would be going in in that uh, particular direction for that uh, uh, expenditure. But we don't. Um, it, it, it's it's it depends on the on the type of road, trunks or routes or uh, gravel roads that might exist in in a particular uh, county. Uh, as to what uh, we could be uh, could be expending, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, on a brief uh, glance, I'm happy to report to you that we're looking at spending uh, almost 13 million dollars this year in uh, the county of Inverness. The member for Inverness. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the minister and the staff. I'd like to to uh, now move to my our colleague from Pick to or from uh, Kings North. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to again uh, question the Minister and his staff on uh, road priorities for uh, Kings North, the Annapolis Valley. And uh, as the Minister knows, the, uh, we had two massive events in Kings County uh, last fall, Hurricane Dorian. and. About 10, 10 days before that, a rainstorm, which almost really doesn't, I've forgotten the name of it, it really is, it's named, but it was a rainstorm of uh, biblical proportions for us where we had seven inches of rain in 24 hours in a small area, an area of maybe 25, 30 square miles mostly. And uh, I just want to start by saying that I hope the minister knows, and I, I think I've said it before, that. Uh, your, your staff and your crew went above and beyond in the uh, aftermath of the rainstorm, which really was hardly recognized outside of our area. Uh, I think uh, that uh, washed out an enormous number of culverts on the mountain, uh, up on uh, Highway 358, and, uh, and certain ones down in the valley, and, and in the aftermath of Dorian, which had a lot of other effects, had a lot of people out of power, and was a lot of, uh, but it, again, your, your staff did exceptional, so I, I do want to note that that uh, we do uh, we do appreciate the DTIR staff there and they're resourceful and uh, they get the job done and I uh, just want to put that on the record uh, before I start asking questions of your staff, Mr. Minister. So uh, please let them know that I said that and uh, when you have the opportunity and, and they know that I say that. Um, one of the things that was exposed as a weakness out of the uh, those two rain events. Uh, Dorian and the storm, the rainstorm 10 days before, uh, was, uh, I would say, an inadequacy in the culverts. And uh, culverts are pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty, they don't, they don't really call a lot of attention to themselves. They're very easy to forget about uh, for a long time, and then, except when suddenly they're overwhelmed and washed out. And uh, uh, we, we saw culverts that had not been overwhelmed by water in 50 years get backed up and overwhelmed, and not small ones either. And in places we saw double culverts uh, four feet around get backed up on watersheds of maybe uh, 100 acres, 200 acres, you know. But when you get seven inches of rain in a very short time, less than 24 hours, it's just in the realm of unbelievable. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, the truth is, I don't really know if that's a one in a hundred year event. Maybe we'll never see that again in our lifetime. I don't really know that, and I know the minister knows too. But where we had two rainstorm events in about ten days, everybody thought this was uh, we need to get on that. Now, will that ever happen again in the, in our tenure uh, here in this legislature? I have no idea. But it um, it begs the plan on uh, on what. 
on, on, on getting those culverts replaced and, and going about it. And I just wonder if the minister could tell me uh, what how he sees that working. I realize there's issues with capital budget versus maintenance budget, and I just wonder if the minister could take me through that. Minister. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, <clears throat> and I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the uh, uh, words of uh, compliment for uh, the staff uh, in your area generally, uh, and it's very heartening to hear that here. Almost every member that has spoken uh, has uh, expressed that sentiment that uh, though nobody's perfect, the folks are out there doing the best they can with what they have to uh, meet, uh, meet the requirement. That's certainly been uh, my experience uh, over the years, uh, both in the municipal government and in uh, provincial government in, in terms of dealing, uh, dealing with the uh, department. <clears throat> I, I wanted to understand completely from Peter what our uh, strategy 
evolving strategy is when it comes to culverts because uh, w I have to admit that we don't really know how many thousands of culverts we have in the province, but we're sure that it's, uh, it is thousands. And in some instances, I know in my own riding, uh, we were, new, new culverts were being discovered when roads were being renovated. Uh, culverts that, that had plugged up over years and the, the, the openings were, weren't even visible and nobody knew there was a culvert there. So sometimes uh, that's a good thing because they were still in good shape and we could open them up and use them. Uh, but obviously uh, we all know that, and, and particularly on gravel roads, that the drainage is the key to keeping the road viable. You've got to get the water off it, you've got to have it crowned, you've got to have it ditched, and you've got to have cross culverts in place where they're, uh, where they're required, uh, which is really the purpose of our gravel road program, which is uh, uh, to, to rebuild the road, uh, make, it a, make it a better quality road, then it's not about just throwing gravel on top of it, which most people think that that's how it works. So, in uh, the evolving uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in with regard to climate change, we do have a, a strategy, an internal strategy when it comes to culverts, is that wherever possible uh, that the culvert is upsized uh, to uh, a, a, a bigger standard uh, in, in terms of its ability to handle, I mean, the in many instances, the oil culverts were 1 to 25, uh, so in other words, one event in 25 years, and we're moving them where we can to 1 in 100, and even as much as 1 in 200 year events uh, to determine the sizing of the culvert. Uh, that's when they're deep, that's viable. Uh, it gets a little bit more expensive to replace them when they're deep, uh, but uh, uh, in the instance where the culvert is shallow, it's a little bit more difficult to upsize them because we're decreasing the um, ride volume there and you can't put the culvert where it'll get beat up and come up through the, through, uh, the, the, uh, through the road uh, surface. Uh, but in, uh, we, we do have a directive inside uh, the department which tells us to look at that very closely when we are uh, uh, either doing our gravel road program or building, replacing, uh, replacing culverts uh, to uh, try and increase them to accommodate what we're seeing uh, around uh, the, 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 the province generally. It's not just limited to your uh, uh, area of the province, though I, 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 it's an incredible amount of rain that you're telling me that you got there seven inches in 24 hours. I don't think I've ever heard of that in uh, anywhere. And, uh, you know, that's an Amazonian. Uh, rainfall, uh, uh, but in, in other areas of the, uh, including my own riding, there are washouts that didn't, uh, uh, hadn't occurred for, uh, for a long, long time. So uh, our strategy is to focus on the culverts. We use uh, not so much steel anymore, uh, our, either cement or, or uh, plastic. Uh, steel on some of the gravel uh, road replacements uh, so that when we do uh, do these uh, uh, um, this maintenance and it comes out of maintenance uh, budget that we upgrade uh, as best we can uh, uh, to accommodate what this uh, new area that we seem to be moving into with regard to handling uh, the drain from the watersheds. The member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Minister, and I appreciate that answer. I, I guess what I would say in response to it is that where we saw, and I mean it was a uh, on Highway 358 going to Scotts Bay on the mountain where we had the worst uh, circumstances, those were culverts that were just a year or two old that had been done. That road had been redone very to a really good standard a couple uh, just a couple years before. And the homeowners there who were like, you know, old salts had said they didn't think the culvert was big enough to start with. Like they had told the company, they, but they hadn't told me But when it was being done. But so I guess the, the thing that I would say is that I would hope that you would look at your engineering specs because this is a lot less money ultimately just to have a big enough culvert in there. So we, we need one in 100 year or one in 200 year because where we can put them in, I recognize what you say about the depth of the 
the, the ditch too. But it just, I think we need to be looking at oversizing just because it saves us a lot of money in the long run. And, it, and they're really, in a bigger culvert, it's really not that much more expensive than a smaller culvert on a multi-million dollar project. So I hope that you will, will do that. I, I hope that I never have to mention it to you again and we never see a rainfall like that again. But if we have one like that again this summer, I'll be banging on your doorstep. Um, but I hope, I hope that doesn't happen. And, and it might not, we don't really know. Um, I do want to uh, mention, uh, the minister knows I had, uh, I had three dangerous intersections that I had been talking to your staff about. One of them was uh, 221 in Middle Dyke, and in fact there's been a red light, a flashing light put there, which was what we wanted. We'd had a couple T-bone and near-miss T-bones and a fuel truck that somehow the driver drove right through and, and uh, he should have stopped. Uh, but it caused a quite a spectacular fire and, and there is a red light installed there and I'm very pleased with that. I just want to say thank you for that. The other two dangerous intersections um, are kind of more, maybe more problematic, but I just want to mention them to the minister again here on the record that one would be the Black Hole Road and 221. Uh, which we, which I don't really know what to tell you to do there either. Like I, I'm not saying that I know the solution. I'm just saying it's an engineering. Somehow we need to to slow people down or change that, uh, or put a three-way stop there. Maybe um, that that might solve it. A three-way stop. No, nobody will be happy then. But uh, but uh, and the other intersection is in North Kentville, which is literally when you're driving up to it is a uh, there's an asterisk sign. If you know what I mean, <laughs> it's it's three three lines. So it's like a six six-way intersection of. Highway 341, uh, Oak Dean Avenue, Lansy, Upper Church, and Campbell. All those roads coming into one intersection. So if you know what I mean, like there's not only that, the sign's actually got an extra line there. It looks like an asterisk. But, and I don't even know if the public understand when they're driving up to it, that's an intersection sign. But that intersection has been the site of some significant accidents and a lot of near misses. So I guess, uh, Mr. Minister, I wanted to mention those uh, and uh, just uh, um, maybe uh, you can just make a comment. I, I think I already know the answer about your intersection repair program. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I thank the uh, member for the uh, advice on the uh, intersections uh, and uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that there was some action taken and, and to, to install a, uh, a flashing red that uh, that really helps because these all these uh, items relate to uh, to safety I will ask the uh, uh, the department to take a look at those uh, two intersections and see if there's any further recommendations that uh, uh, they would uh, have to make on the North Kentville one, uh, my thought when you described it would be the uh, would, would be a roundabout as a possible solution there, and I wouldn't know if there's enough room. Uh, would we have to acquire additional uh, or dislocate houses or anything to to get it in there? But in the long term, if you've got a busy intersection like that, then. Uh, uh, that would and, and uh, that w that's not in the town of Kentville. Uh, no, uh, then then a roundabout might be the long-term answer uh, for a site like that, which is, you know, it, they, they tend to be fairly expensive. Uh, a, a sophisticated one could be five six million dollars, but they're a permanent, safe solution to uh, uh, to what we're doing, uh, what we're looking for. So. Uh, that's a possibility for something that we could look at uh, and see if we could work it into a capital plan uh, uh, down down the road because that sounds like a pretty unusual circumstance, especially where you go, if you got the asterisk sign. Like, who the heck would understand what that uh, is supposed to represent? You know, uh, I haven't seen one of those. Uh, so I, I, we'll undertake to take a look at those both those intersections and see if we can uh, come up with uh, a solution. The member for Kings North. Um, thank you, Mr. Minister, and anything that can be done there uh, is appreciated. Um, 
I just want to mention uh, again uh, another thing to say thank you to you for was uh, the fact that we had uh, two crews going uh, last summer doing potholes in Kings North and Kings South. There's just so, and I know the member for Kings South would agree, there's just between Kings North and Kings South, there's, it's, we share one garage and uh, there's, we need uh, to, to get the potholes done before September, October, we need two cr crews going. And there's just a lot of roads, a lot of potholes. Uh, uh, I know the minister and his staff know what, what the situation is on the valley floor with roads that are on clay. Uh, you know, so I, I, I want to ask, will, will there again be two crews uh, repairing potholes in, in Kings North, Kings South this year? Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank the member for the question. And I guess uh, upon reflection, uh, <clears throat> the presence of the second crew uh, is reflective of things working the way they're supposed to work. That's something that you brought uh, to me, and uh, we were able to implement it. And uh, this evening, I see no change in the plans, and there will be two crews there again this year. The member for Kings North. Uh, I would I would like to take half the credit for that with the member from <laughs> Kings South. I think he brought that to you too. So, uh, uh, and and his constituents and my constituents, as I think I mentioned at the time, you know, uh, of all the things that DTIR does, what really gets our constituents uh, upset is when their vehicles are getting damaged by potholes and. Uh, uh, and there can be a pothole there that they can avoid a hundred times and the hundred and one time they hit it, right? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the reality of the roads in Indianapolis Valley. We have a lot of economic activity and uh, a lot of trucks, a lot of heavy farm equipment, and the roads are built on clay, on sand, on, uh, there's not, there was not that much rock maybe available when those roads were built back in the day, a hundred years ago. Um, I guess I want to, uh, um, turn uh, my attention to uh, maybe a little more difficult topic for us, uh, Mr. Minister. We've agreed on a lot of things so far, and that is the um, Hansport Abateau. And uh, I just want to ask, uh, what uh, what's the life expectancy of the current Abateau? What's the, what's the hope there? And uh, maybe I know there is uh, an extension needed on the Abateau gates being in. And has the minister received the extension on that? And maybe you can update me on the repairs there. Safe traveling. <laughs> Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Member, for the uh, question. Uh, yeah, that's uh, when I mentioned yesterday that I had a lot of experience with abatos. Uh, this is one of the ones that uh, has educated me uh, in the whole concept of the uh, the abato uh, process there, and uh, it's been a, a you know I don't mind saying that it's been a tough one to uh, 
to apprehend when you're taking on the Bay of Fundy. It's, a, it's not an easy uh, wrestling match, uh, for sure. So uh, we have actually uh, uh, found that the gates uh, help our problem with erosion considerably. Uh, but the gates were uh, granted to us as a temporary measure from DFO. And we have actually asked for an extension uh, on, the, on the, the gates, which is in their system, and we haven't received that, uh, uh, that decision or information back uh, uh, as yet. In the meantime, we are reinforcing the berm on the... Uh, on the Fundy side, isn't it? Yeah, we did it on both sides. Yeah, we'll work yeah. On the Fundy side. yeah. On the, on the Bay of Fundy side, currently we already did the other side, uh, which will deflect the uh, the pressure that was coming onto the actual uh, uh, culverts themselves, and hopefully that will stop the kind of erosion that uh, and movement that was. Uh, in the process. Uh, the berms are stable. Uh, we expect that the work will be completed by uh, this spring. The contractor is uh, on site currently working and we're hoping <clears throat> that we'll have a, a, a permanent uh, solution uh, there uh, by, you know, by the spring. Once the late spring comes, we get, it, uh, we get that done. You know, we have a lot of valuable uh, public infrastructure upstream there. We have the bridge. We have the, I think it's Highway 1 that runs through there, uh, which is in danger from flooding. It's very low along there. And then, of course, we have the actual uh, overpass uh, uh, on the, the 101, uh, though uh, the reports that we have and the inspections we've done there uh, say that there's no threat at that particular location. As you might know, uh, Madam Chair, it is farther up the... Uh, uh, up the wash there from the uh, first bridge that's uh, right down by the uh, right down by the Abito itself. So uh, uh, that's the latest that we have on it. And uh, uh, once we hear back from uh, DFO, we'll be informed as to um, what they see us uh, doing with the with the gates that are there. The member for Kings North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I realize it's been extraordinarily uh, difficult for the, uh, it's been a difficult job, there's no doubt about it. Um, I guess what I would like to ask the Minister is it's uh, known in the community that there was, uh, uh, and I believe the number is 25 tons of foam put into the interior of that uh, uh, abato because there was a cavity inside of it that was discovered, and I presume. I'm certain that it wasn't residential foam. I, I'm wondering if the minister could tell me the brand and uh, the the product number, whatever, what what the foam was, and and, and tell me a little bit about that. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. We don't have that information at our fingertips, but we would undertake to supply that uh, to the member once we do identify it. The member for Kings North. Um, <clears throat> all right, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister, and uh, I am interested in knowing the, uh, the product identity there. Um, and uh, I think. Uh, I don't know how widely known that all is, but it's rather uh, astonishing that the ocean could could cause a cavity that would require 25 tons of foam to fill uh, in in a very very short time. Um, I do want to talk about the um, Windsor Causeway, and I know that the tender is out on that. I'm, I just want to ask about, um, uh, I, and in fact. Uh, you know, uh, fish passage on uh, on the new design. So, I know that uh, DFO has to sign off on fish passage on the new the new design. I know you've issued the tender on the new design. I'm just wondering, has DFO signed off on fish passage on the design?
Minister. Aaron, thank the member for the question. Uh, this, is, this is the other abato that has helped educate me in uh, uh, how water flows. And, uh, you know, I mean, a, an abato really at the end of the day is, is a backwater valve, I guess, in the simplest uh, part, and that I understand. It had a fancy name. I didn't understand exactly what it, uh, uh, what it was designed to do, but it's brilliant engineering, very simple. Uh, we got it right hundred some years ago, but we're having our struggles uh, uh, at the Halfway River. But at, at Windsor, we have a, a, a completely different uh, sor sort of circumstance. And uh, one of the one of our members of the House had a question last night about an abato that was in a bridge at Parisboro, and that is the same situation that we had at uh, Halfway River, where we're having our challenges, and was the case at uh, Win at, at Windsor uh, Abateau. And the design that we've settled on. Uh, which is a very uh, expensive, uh, uh, will produce a very expensive piece of infrastructure, uh, is been separated from the roadway itself. So you have the road and you have a separate abato which will act independently, which in the long haul, uh, I believe, is a lot better uh, for us. Uh, there might be some expediency associated with putting these, uh, these passageways in the road, but eventually it's going to get to you in terms of what you have to do to replace them, uh, either the road or the, uh, the abateau itself. <clears throat> so uh, in, in Windsor, the, uh, we, we haven't actually tendered it. We're thinking it's going to be a late uh, year tender, uh, but the design uh, work is being done by CBCL and is nearing uh, completion. And of course, the design will inform the uh, uh, will inform the, the tender uh, that will be put together at that uh, point in, in time. So we're expecting that that design work will be uh, available in the summer time. It'll be completed. And uh, in the meantime, we've got a huge uh, group of stakeholders involved, uh, you know, from the Aboriginal community, from the uh, uh, Department of uh, Agriculture, who will be involved, our own people, and uh, Aboriginal Affairs and, you know, people who are in DFO uh, who have an interest in the, uh, uh, the, the abateau. And the general objective uh, is to permit fish, fish passage in the, uh, uh, in, in the abateau. So uh, that's kind of where that's at. Uh, it is, we received uh, significant support from the federal government. Uh, for the uh, abateau, and that's uh, that's done. We know we're going to get that uh, that funding, which is I think half of the uh, projected around uh, thirty uh, thirty two million dollars actually that uh, we've received from the Fed. So it's underway. It's uh, going to be done. It's going to be a, a special design which will separate the roadway and the abateau, and we're hoping that. Uh, uh, we will. That will be an improvement over what we had before, and it will permit the fish passage in the uh, in the area, in the river. I recognize the honourable <clears throat> member for Kings North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to have one more question, and then I'll I'll let. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your answers. One last question. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague from uh, Northside Westbound. But my my last question is: Can the minister tell me the the cost of the Abateau in Hansport to date with the original structure, uh, construction costs plus the emergency repair costs, which is I know is ongoing, but so an approximate number of the cost to date of that Abateau and, uh, and its repairs and its emergency repairs and maybe what, what they're thinking it will cost. And thank you for your answers, Mr. Minister. Minister. Okay, Madam Chair, thank the member for the question. Uh, as I believe I've said publicly uh, recently, uh, we're at approximately $6.5 million uh, in year to date uh, for that one. And I can't, uh, just some additional work to be done, and I can't put a number on that uh, for you at this time. 
I recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank the minister and his department for the wonderful job they're doing over the what's been a very trying number of months, and in the case of Cape Breton, a very white winter. Uh, they've worked tireless, hard, hard hours, and it's almost impossible to keep everybody happy, but they're keeping working to keep everyone safe. And now, soon, they'll be transitioning to fixing our pothole issues. A couple of issues that I'd like to bring up. Um, one is the Highway 125 between that connects from North Sydney through to Grand Lake Road on the east side of Sydney. Has there's year, every year there's work being done on the highway, but every year there's ruts developing on and on and on. And there's one particular area where there seems to be some work going on this year that's on either side of a particularly troubling stretch between exits four and five. Um, this is a stretch that's just before what we've, um, Campbell's Hill before the French Vale exit, when you're traveling westbound towards the north side. A uh, constituent of mine, was their daughter was traveling on the road back in December, Jan mid-December, and they ended up, it was raining, they lost, got stuck in the ruts, they lost control of their car, went off the road, the car rolled a few times and was written off. So it's a, it is a very dangerous stretch of highway. And, you know, unfortunately, at some point in time, there may be something, a more severe um, accident. We certainly hope not, but it's entirely possible. To that end, I know the ruts are an issue across this province. Um, understandably, this my particular area in the stretch that I'm referring to is of particular interest to me. But I'm just curious if the minister could provide some information related to what the um, department's policy is related to um, addressing these ruts um, when the decision is made to shave them and repave those sections. Because usually, it's it's not necessarily a long stretch of road in some instances, just to deal with the worst of the worst areas. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank the member for the question. Uh, when it comes to safety, uh, we don't want to spare any horses uh, uh, around making sure that people who drive on our highways are safe. Uh, and um, in the overall picture, we do have a, a scientific system. Uh, we have something called an ARAN vehicle that is, uh, goes on all our 100 series highways. And one of its functions, and the most important one, is to measure the depth of the rutting. And there's a certain tolerance, and once it gets beyond that tolerance, which shows up in the information that is uh, produced by the technology, uh, then we would uh, go in, uh, regardless of scheduling for work, and do uh, a long stretch patch to capture uh, the rutted uh, area itself. Uh, in your particular instance, uh, for this year, 2021, on Highway 125, 
We've got westbound lane um, east of Frenchvale Road for six kilometers. That's underway. Is that what you were talking about? What, um... the, the member for Northside Westmount. Oh. Um, sorry, it, it could be I get the west and east mixed up, westbound lane be going. That could be the stretch. Minister? We hope that, uh, that it is. That's uh, six, uh, six kilometers. Uh, and uh, then also on the uh, eastbound lane, lane from Highway 105, uh, there's another 5.6 kilometers, uh, which is uh, in, the, uh, in the system to be, uh, to be done uh, also. So that's 11.6 kilometers on the 125. That's for this year. But if we don't capture that section of rutted road that you're talking about, let me know and uh, we'll uh, make sure that we get it patched in the meantime. The member for Northside Westmount. Madam Chair, and I thank the minister for that um, answer. I, hopefully that is that stretch and I'll certainly um, check and let you know if that is in the stretch because I appreciate that those ruts are a very fluid situation and it's a case-by-case -case basis as the need develops because you know now that we're getting into spring it's the sort of thing that can you know jump ahead leaps and bounds compared to year over year with the winter and that. Um, another area of concern relates to the Highway 105 and a constituent called me about this last week and I've, I never really paid attention to what they told me. So when I was coming t to Halifax this week, I took, you know, paid attention to the, that stretch from Port Hastings to North Sydney. And I counted the number of intersections that have left-hand turns, and like an individual lane for vehicles making left-hand turns. And I counted 19 between the, where the Trans-Canada Highway begins at the Marine Atlantic Ferry Terminal and Port Hastings. Yes. So in that stretch, just when you leave North Sydney or you're just exiting the um, town, the former town, there's an intersection with the Trans-Canada, the 105 and what's called Tobin Road. Tobin Road has become um, the major entry and exit point through the what's called the Northside Industrial Park. The school buses going to the Memorial High School use that road. Um, transfer trucks coming in to deliver goods and products to the um, various businesses in the industrial park go in that road and there's been uh, numerous c close calls, what have you. There was also in the summertime, as you can appreciate, with marine Atlantic traffic, you'll have long stretches of traffic that when they come off the boat, they go and when they're trying to get to the boat, they're moving too. So that's an area where that can create a bottleneck and the potential for some serious um, issues. So I was just wondering, I didn't see it on the five-year plan. Uh, I don't know if it's something that's been brought to your department's attention previously, but it's definitely, you know, along that stretch, there's just the last couple of seasons, the um, left-hand turn lanes were put in in place in Bedeck by the, to serve the Tim Hortons and the Irving. So this is right in, right in the urban area, and there's no left-hand turn put there, and the traffic is... Comp, you know, comparable if not equal to the tra level of traffic that would be going through that stretch in Bedeck. Um, it's great that that was put there in Bedeck because that is a, I've seen some pretty near misses along that stretch. But once again, this is an area that in, in North Sydney, when you're first coming into town, that I'd like to bring to the attention of the department and for, you know, for yourself and your engineers to consider.
order. Time has lapsed for the PC um, party. We'll move on to the NDP for the remaining time, 20 minutes, well, 30 minutes. I recognize the honorable, uh, wait, 20, 20 minutes. Uh, I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Excuse me, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted to begin this last 20 minutes talking about potholes. Um, I'm sure you've been doing a lot of that. Um, and it's not something that, you know, I often hear about. I hear about it a little bit at a certain time of year in, in Dartmouth North with the circumferential highway. And, um, but you may know that uh, the NDP caucus did a uh, FOI pop into the Road Hazards Claims and Investigations Program after a number of people came to us, uh, constituents, um, uh, came to us with you know complaints about that process. So they, their cars got damaged on potholes on 100 series highways. They they put in a claim. They were denied. They didn't appeal. They were denied. Extreme frustration. Um, and then so the FOIPOP revealed that in the last, say, five years, um, the number of claims paid out, have the percentage of claims paid out and the number of paid claims paid out have st steadily gone down. So um, I'm wondering if the minister, uh, you know, we asked about this in question period the other day. The premier said he would take a look at it. I'm wondering if the, the minister can commit to taking a look at this program and seeing if there's a way to make it more transparent uh, so that um, it's clear to the public uh, what the expectations are um, and and how exactly the metrics of when a pothole needs to be fixed after it's reported and all of those different rules, if those can be clarified for the public in some way. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the, uh, uh, for the question. And <clears throat> indeed, that did uh, uh, come up, and uh, we uh, started the reaction since that uh, uh, period in, in question period. <clears throat> the uh, actual program itself, and, uh, and uh, that would be the application from the affected party. Uh, doesn't come to our department. It actually goes to inter Internal Services Division, and they're the ones that handle that uh, uh, that uh, particular program. However, uh, I'm not trying to escape responsibility here. Uh, we are the ones who set the response times and uh, do the repairs uh, on the uh, uh, on the um, potholes. Uh, that that uh, we know are a problem for people, uh, uh, 
you know, with the cost of a vehicle, particularly in the rural areas uh, uh, where people rely on the vehicles, there's no, uh, there's no transit system, uh, take a lot of pride in their vehicles, and uh, it really is uh, upsetting when they, uh, they hit, a, hit a pothole and have any damage in alignment or uh, bumper damage or whatever. So uh, we, we understand that part of it. What we're actually looking at doing, too, is a jurisdictional scan across the country to see what the uh, similar provinces, particularly in the Atlantic region where we have a similar climate, uh, are doing <clears throat> and how they handle their, uh, their uh, pothole uh, damage uh, arrangement, which will give us uh, more information as to uh, where we are in the picture in terms of how our our response uh, lines up and how adequate it is and all that sort of thing. But uh, I guess what I can tell you at this point in time is that we are reacting, that we're working with ISD to start looking at uh, the program, how it works, and the jurisdictional scan will tell us relative to the rest of the country where we, uh, where we are. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, I thank the minister for that answer, and I'm very uh, heartened to hear that that will be taking place, a review of that will be taking place, so I uh, look forward to the results of that. That's great. I um, wanted to ask a little bit about ride sharing. What is the licensing regime being considered for ride hailing services in Nova Scotia? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the, for the question. Uh, we are working uh, on uh, analyzing the um, regulations that we have uh, currently in place. Uh, we have met uh, with both the larger uh, ride-sharing uh, companies, uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, and understand what their view of the world is. Um, they, you know, they tell us that the Nova Scotia market is a relatively small market uh, for them, but that they are interested in uh, in uh, in uh, Nova Scotia in particular because of the prevalence of uh, uh, the, gro the the growth center that is Metro and the. Um, Proliferation of proliferation of universities that are here, which has got young people who are uh, prone to the uh, the new technology. Uh, the <clears throat> essentially uh, the uh, advent of um, Uber into the marketplace is not unlike the advent of the uh, Airbnb uh, uh, system. Um, which has been around for quite a while now and, and is extensively used in, uh, uh, in Nova Scotia and prompted uh, actually some legislation that was required to accommodate the, uh, the, the uh, house sharing uh, situation that, uh, that Airbnb uh, represents. So essentially what you have is a giant dispatch company, like taxi companies use dispatchers, they have somebody in a central office, fire departments use uh, uh, dispatchers, central dispatchers will collect a bunch of fire departments together and do dispatch. Here you have uh, the mobilization of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of individual drivers who have an asset, which is their vehicle, that they can use to generate a bit of more income uh, with. So. 
<clears throat> I'm, what I'm saying is that this whole concept is, is here, it's not going to be going away, and uh, eventually we have to understand how it fits into our marketplace. But we want to make sure that the, uh, the, the presence of these ride-sharing companies in the uh, uh, province will not affect the safety of our, uh, of our uh, uh, motoring public and uh, the folks who would be clients for, uh, <clears throat> for uh, Uber or Lyft or whatever ride-sharing company uh, uh, comes into play. In, in the instance of PEI, uh, I'm told that the market is uh, small over there so that their Uber and Lyft are not interested. So there's a local homegrown uh, company that is um, avidly pursuing, and I think uh, PEI has made an accommodation for them uh, to supply that uh, uh, service in uh, Charlottetown, but it won't be called uh, Uber or Lyft. It's a private uh, PEI uh, entrepreneurial group. So. Um, we're looking at uh, how we can uh, 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 accept this new process into our uh, Nova Scotia motoring community, but do it in a way that doesn't compromise uh, uh, either passenger or a driver safety in the uh, process. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, much appreciated. Yeah, so I guess that's that's kind of what I'm asking is, in, in the, I think you're probably right, these types of technologies aren't going anywhere, uh, and uh, and they do affect thousands of people. So um, my, I guess my question is, how will the province, what, what role will the province play in making sure that the safety of passengers is ensured, the safety of the drivers is ensured. Um, you know, how will, how will those things affect, how will, the, how will the, the presence of the companies affect the taxi industry? Will the taxi industry and the ride sharing industry align in terms of the regulations? And the other very important part of it is how is the province, or how can the province in, um, enable uh, or, or ensure that labor issues like you know long hours, um, low pay, <laughs> exploitive conditions, worker safety issues, and don't forget if drivers are you know underpaid and overtired, they're also not as safe. Um, you know how is the province making sure it's all going to work okay for everybody? <laughs> the minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank the member for the uh, for the question. Uh, we we in, in our department are concerned about uh, uh, the uh, licensing uh, uh, process that would be involved in uh, in in the uh, allowing the companies to come and operate here, and we want to make sure that uh, with regard to the taxi industry that we have a level playing field, that there's no advantage sought or given in the, uh, uh, in the process. Beyond that, uh, the taxi business is municipally driven. The municipalities are the ones that have the responsibility for licensing uh, taxi cabs uh, and, and uh, would ha also have the responsibility for uh, the conditions that, uh, under which Uber would operate. Um, that is the case uh, across the province. I think 23 of the 49 municipalities have uh, taxi bylaws, as it were, currently. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, uh, responsibility beyond uh, any tweaking of the licensing process that the government might, might want to do is the, the responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the receiving municipality. Um, from my understanding of how the system works, uh, and, and again going back to the Airbnb as, a, as a, an example, uh, the Airbnb properties are rated with a, with a star rating. Uh, there's comments there as to what people's uh, likes or dislikes were, and it creates the rating, the star rating, and and then also the 
uh, Airbnb operator is able to comment on the quality of the of the uh, tenant that they have for the short time. So there's a bit of a self-policing process involved there. And in my conversations with Uber, they actually employ the same system. Uh, they have, uh, they have uh, uh, a process that screens applicants, uh, that uh, requires uh, uh, the uh, rating system to happen and so that they know uh, if there is red flags or with the driver or uh, with a uh, passenger, uh, they're able to, uh, to capture that. So that uh, more sophisticated built-in process uh, is uh, a hallmark of this technology where it's internet-based uh, and that doesn't exist currently in the uh, uh, in the taxi industry per se, but I'm sure it won't take long for them to uh, uh, adopt uh, adopt that. So uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the 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 licensing process or setting the conditions uh, rests with the municipal unit, and uh, the provincial uh, responsibility is for the uh, class of license that uh, the uh, that the. Uh, mm, Taxi cab operator, uh, ambulance driver, small bus driver, or Uber driver should attain to uh, uh, be able to conduct that uh, business in the province. Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the other day, I had the pleasure of having a, a meeting with some uh, senior staff in the department, uh, which I always appreciate. Nice to get, um, nice to get uh, to a little update on what's going on in the department. And one of the things we talked about was um, the Traffic Safety Act and the uh, regulations and what's going on with all the regulations. And my understanding from that meeting was that, you know, regulations were taking a little longer than expected, um, uh, but also that. Um, they they really weren't sure in what way they were going to sort of bring the regulations back to the community. Um, and uh, one option was to like sort of get a whole section of regulations done and then, um, and then sort of like bring them out and get people to sort of give their opinions and then, um, then take another section of regulations and get people to give their opinions? Um, or what, were, were, were they going to do all the regulations and then put it out there for feedback before they pro get the bill proclaimed uh, and tweak things? So I'm just wondering if there's any update on that and, um, and if the minister can provide <clears throat> an up a, pl a plan or, a, or uh, what, what has gone into the planning for a consultation phase of those regulations when, when it's time. And then will it be? Minister of Transportation with two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank the member for the question. Yes, the, the and I mentioned earlier, I think that the uh, uh, TSA is transformative uh, and comprehensive in uh, attempting to capture all the stuff that's happened really for 100 years, because the old legislation uh, dated back to 1921. And uh, so, uh, So as a result, uh, it's a lot of work to try and incorporate all that uh, information in the, uh, in the uh, uh, regulation. Uh, we have a team working on, on that uh, in particular, and we're expecting that they will be, uh, they will be 
able to uh, bring the regulations forward by the fall of this year. And as part of that, there has been ongoing consult consultation going on with stakeholders up to this process. So that's going to be circling back to those stakeholders and uh, having consultations again uh, with those people under regulations before they're enacted. The member for Dartmouth North with one minute. So is it fair to say uh, that the public can expect a proclaimed Traffic Safety Act with all its rights and privileges uh, uh, by the fall of 2020? The Minister of Transportation with one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's our in intended target, yes. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, it hardly seems appropriate to start a whole other subject here, uh, Mr. Chair, so I guess I will slowly take the time I have left to thank the Minister for, uh, and uh, your staff for your excellent answers. It's always a pleasure to talk about transportation infrastructure renewal, and I do seriously appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the a chance to uh, um, to talk with people like Royden Trainer, who uh, I've talked to on, on a number of issues, constituency issues, uh, and other staff people, uh, Darcy McBain at Dartmouth, they're all great. They're all uh, they all get back to me, and it's, and I really appreciate it. So please pass that on to them, and thank you so much. Order. <laughs> Time is allotted for the consideration of supply today. Uh, time allotted for the consideration of supply today is elapsed. I recognize the Honourable House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that you, the committee do now rise and that you report progress and beg leave to sit again. Motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House.
order not or order the chair of the committee of the whole house on supply reports that the committee of the whole house on supply has met and made progress and begs leave to sit again i recognize the honorable government house leader thank you madam chair i move that you do now leave the chair and the house resolve itself into a committee of the whole house on bills the motion is carried we will now rise and go to the committee of the whole house on bills Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 234, the House of Assembly Act. 
I call Bill No. 234, the House of Assembly Act, an act to amend. I recognize the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill No. 234 was returned from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains one clause. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. carry. Shall Clause 2, I recognize. No? Oh, shall the remaining clauses carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. Okay. Before we proceed, I just want to make sure that all members have change sheet CWHB Gov 1. Pardon? Yes. Okay. okay. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call bill number 236, the Railways Act? I call bill number 236, the Railway Act, an act to amend. The clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 236 contains 16 clauses and was referred to the committee to the House, pardon me, from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments. Shall Clause One carry? Carry. Carry. Okay. Clause Two. I am going to break into two parts. Two A. Shall paragraph 2A carry? Carry. carry. Okay, so now we're, at 2B. we're now at 2B. Which minister? I recognize the Minister for Tra Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, refer to CWHB Gov 1, page 1, clause 2, proposed subsection 4. Uh, four delete or to non-operating railways in the second line. Oh, I recognize the honorable member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Just wondering if the minister could explain what's meant by that and whether it would apply to the existing Cape Breton, Nova Scotia rail line. I recognize the honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. The, uh, that particular line is not abandoned. It is an operating railway. Uh, this speaks more to uh, railway lines that are uh, abandoned, uh, railway lines that are being used for trail uh, activity around the province. Oh, I recognize the Honorable House Leader for the NDP. Um, I would also join my colleagues in asking for further explanation. Um, we didn't have notice of this. This, this clause appears to indicate um, that this amendment would now uh, apply to non-operating railways, whereas the original legislation here says that it would not apply to non-operating railways. Um, and so I think we need to understand a little bit more what that means and what it would impact here in the province.
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. As I indicated, there are uh, various uh, states uh, that uh, railways are uh, across the province, and uh, the, uh, this particular amendment applies to uh, non-operating railways, and uh, it removes that definition. Uh, and, and would change the definition to accept where expressly provided this act does not apply to non-licensed railways. So it's removing non-operating railways, that definition from the uh, uh, amended legislation. I, I recognize the honorable member for Inverness. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to raise uh, briefly uh, that I did reach out to the Cape Breton Central Nova Scotia Railway and they weren't aware of this legislation was coming to the legislature. So I just, I just want to make the minister aware of that. And as a concern, if, if, if this is something that's impacting them, I think it would be important at a courtesy that they be made aware before it passes uh, through this legislature. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Uh, the information that I have, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, is that uh, the affected parties were all uh, contacted and the legislation was discussed with them. Does the amendment carry? Carry. The amendment is, is carried. Does, does Clause 2 as amended carry? Carry. Do clauses 3 through 16 carry? carry. Does the title carry? carry? Does the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act? I call Bill Number 238, the Insurance Act, an act to amend. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill 238 was re uh, contains three clauses and was referred from the Committee of Law Amendments to the House without amendments. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House.
order. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House and Bills reports. That the Committee of the Whole has uh, that the Committee of the Whole has met and considered the following bills. Bills number 234 and 238 without amendments, and Bill 236 with certain amendments, and the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Ordered that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can I ask for a short recess? We will now take a short recess.
Order, please. Good Friday evening to all. Earlier today, the House Leader for the Official Opposition rose on a point of privilege relating to the proceedings before the Law Amendments Committee. I have taken extensive time and reviewed the video of the proceedings and I will now deliver my ruling. At the very beginning of Law Amendments Committee meeting earlier today, the Leader of the Official Opposition <clears throat> made a motion to defer the consideration of his proposed amendment to Bill Number 243 until after the hearing from all the scheduled witnesses on all of the bills on the committee's agenda. The chair of the committee agreed but did not put the motion to a vote or seek the consent of the committee. After the sole witness of Bill 243 made her presentation, the chair recognized the member for Hans East who put forth a motion for Bill 243 to be reported to the House without amendments. Some debate ensued. At the request of the member for Hans East on a point of order, the chair immediately put the motion to a vote without further debate and the motion was passed. The leader of the official opposition and the member for Kings North attempted to raise points of order but were not recognized by the chair who proceeded to hear the witnesses on the next bills. Under normal circumstances, the speakers have ruled in this house that committees are masters of their own domain and the committee procedural matters are to be dealt with by the committee. Having said that, there is precedent in this house of a similar case from June 21st, 2001, when Speaker Scott was faced with a similar situation and that ruling has guided me today. I want to caution this House that members such as this would and normally should be dealt with by the committee itself. However, Speaker Goss in his ruling of November the 8th, 2012, when referring to the 2001 decision of Speaker Scott stated, and I quote, clearly, there could be exceptional and extreme circumstances that could warrant consideration of a point of privilege arising from a committee raised by an individual member, end quote. I find this case before me today to be an exceptional and extreme circumstance. I therefore find that in this case, there is a prima facie, a breach of privilege. I remind all members of the House that it is not for me to decide whether the incident would constitute a breach of privilege. That is for this House to decide. Normally, in raising a point of privilege, the member doing so proposes a resolution referring the matter to a committee. In our House, that would normally be the Internal Affairs Committee. However, the remedy sought in this case by the House Leader for the Official Opposition is in effect to refer the bill back to the Law Amendments Committee. So the motion before the House is to refer the bill back to the Law Amendments Committee. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. There's been a call for a recorded vote. We will ring the bells until the whips are satisfied.
much for listening. Order, please. Just before we proceed with the recorded vote, uh, I'd like to remind all members to remain perfectly silent while the clerks conduct the vote. When your name is called, please stand tall and state the simple yay or nay. We'll now have the recorded vote on the motion to refer Bill 243 back to the Law Amendments Committee. The clerks will now conduct the recorded vote. Mr. Churchill. Nay. Mr. Fury. No. Another cover up, okay. Ms. Regan. No. Mr. McClellan. No. Mr. McNeil. No. Ms. Casey. No. Mr. Wilson. No. Mr. Delory. No. Mr. Caldwell. No. Mr. Glavine. No. Mr. Kasoulis. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Porter. No. Mr. Hines. No. Ms. Metlidjdieb. No. Mr. Ince. No. Mr. Rankin. No. Mr. Momberket. No. Ms. Arab. Mr. Horn. No. Mr. Jessam. No. Mr. McGuire. No. Ms. Lonas Croft. No. Ms. Di Costanzo. No. Mr. Irving. No. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Bain. Yes. Ms. Maslin. Yes. Ms. McFarlane. Yes. Mr. Houston. Yes. Mr. McMaster. Yes. Ms. Chender. Yes. Mr. Burrell. Yes. Ms. Roberts. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Mr. McKay. Ms. Adams. Yes. Mr. Lohr. Yes. Mr. Hullman. Yes. Mr. Rushton. Yes. Mr. Craig. Yes. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Yes. Mr. Johns. Yes. Mr. Comer. Yes. Monsieur Leblanc. Oui. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Ms. Pond. Yes. Those in favor of the mo motion, 22. Those against, 24. Motion is defeated. Just before I go to the government house leader, order please. Just before I go to the government house leader, I'll present uh, the ruling on the tabling of the bills from law amendments. Earlier today, when the chair of the law amendments committee reported the bills back to the house, I took the matter under advisement. Given the outcome of the motion uh, seconds ago, I now accept the report and refer those bills to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the government business for today. I move the House now rise to meet again, again Monday, March 9th, 2020, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine, business will include the continuation of the Committee on Supply, Committee of the Whole House on Bills for Bills 233, 240, 241, 242, 243, and 246. I'd also note for the House that the Committee on Private and Local Bills will meet at 10 a.m. Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise. There's been a call for a recorded vote. We'll ring the bells for one hour.
Order, please. Clerks will now conduct the recorded vote on the motion to adjourn. I'd like to remind all members to remain silent uh, while the vote is underway. And when your name is called, please stand tall and state a simple yea or nay. Clerks will now conduct the recorded vote. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Yes. Ms. Casey. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Kusulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metlich Diab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Mr. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Momberkett. Yes. Ms. Arab. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Ms. Lonis Croft. Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. No. Ms. McFarlane. No. Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. Ms. Chender. Mr. Burrell. Yes. Ms. Roberts. Ms. LeBlanc. Mr. McKay. Ms. Adams. No. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. No. Mr. Johns. No. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. No. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. No. Ms. Pawn. Yes. Those in favor of the motion, 26. Those against, 16. Motion carried. The House now stands adjourned until Monday at 11 a.m.